Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everybody. Welcome into another Thursday Night V Pub. If you're tuning in because you've been attracted by the subject matter here, V150A colouring and whiskey, this is a live stream you've tuned into. You might be picking this up on the replay. And if that's the case, and if I've been good and I've done my housekeeping, please check in the description box below and I'll put a timestamp in there so you can skip forward to the relevant part of this video where we actually talk about colouring and whiskey because there's lots of other things to talk about as well. But if you are watching it in the replay, thank you. In the meantime, thanks to everybody that's joined and live. Thanks. Pull up a seat in the lounge next to your fellow whiskey folk, patrons and barflies. Tell us where you are. Tell us what you're sipping. And of course, you've turned up so that you're not sipping alone. And if you've done that, type barfly in big capital letters in the chat and I'll try and shout out your name as, it, as the chat scrolls past. Welcome, everybody. Cheers and slant your back. As you picked up the loose theme tonight is colouring and whiskey. Always a controversial one, a curious one. Um, and I'm on record, everybody knows what my attitude is towards colouring and whiskey, and that's kind of one of, I would say, uh, awareness. And that is, um, you know, understand why colouring exists in whiskey, why it's there, it's a historical thing, it's a bit of a legacy now. Um, and uh, understand what kind of whiskies that the colouring appears in, and just be aware of it when you're considering about buying whiskey, where that whiskey is pointed at, what market it's meant to address. And um, using that kind of rationale, you can often discover if there are whiskies out there that are um, sometimes cynically being coloured, because I think it does happen. And that's partly, um, well, it's one of the biggest frustrations I have, if I'm honest. So my attitude is kind of one of awareness. But I have changed my position a little bit on it, if I'm honest. And I would like to share with you how I feel about colouring and whiskey. Um, but I'll save it till later in the video because uh, we're going to go through a little experiment tonight. Um, I've got a guest coming on later on. Ben Clarkson from Whiskey Geek Channel is going to drop in and join me. He put out a video recently that was really interesting on colouring and whiskey. And uh, I invited Ben along to join me uh, tonight so that we could join in a little bit of an experiment together. So I'll share more with you about that a wee bit later on. Let's jump in, grab this chat. Now, welcome some of you guys. The chat is moving a wee bit fast already, but I'll do my best. <laughs> There's a lot of barflies in tonight, fantastic. Lee Woodrow, good to have you in, Lee. You're shouting barfly. Dr. Feelgood, is that a new name? Good to welcome you in, Dr. Feelgood. Tell me where you are. Uh, Toby Field is shouting barfly. My friend, the, the whiskey uh, rev is in and he's saying v -Pub's awesome, but wish we were all at a big whiskey event. You and I do too, big guy. You and I do too. Uh, the Rev joined us at the gathering in Glasgow and lots of people were able to meet the Rev and discover that he is actually a real guy. Um, good to welcome you in. Uh, and I think Jason also is going to be joining a wee bit later as well to help me out with the chat tonight. Graham Murphy is in. Good to have you, Graham. You're shouting barfly. Emery McGill is also in. Good to have you, Emery. Hilted Moose, Scott, fantastic. Steve A, Service Alaphis, Whiskey Wim, Stuart, good to see you. Carol Van Wallingham, Art Baggy, Andy, good to have you in. Jez as well, London Whiskey Club. Jez, talk a wee bit about the London Whiskey Club in a little while. Um, Toby Field, good to welcome you in, Toby. Luna Aaron, Simon Ray, good to have you, Simon. Uh, Hoyt Hempel is here, good theme. I can tell you that Hoyt is joining us from Glasgow. Hoyt's uh, normally somewhere close to Chicago, but he's in Glasgow, and I know that because I got to hang out with him last night. I got to enjoy couple of drams with Hoyt and Glasgow along with uh, Warner and Warner's son Warner who is known as the One Glass Man. That was a great night, a great opportunity to meet with, with those guys and then uh, share a, a, a real dram as opposed to a virtual one. Greg McQueen is in, good to have you. Uh, uh, Greg from France is also in as well, good to have you both. Raymond is in, Raymond Struble, greetings, that's a new name, another new name, Raymond. Fantastic to welcome you in as well. Bert Hoog Martins, another new name. Bert, good to have you in. He said greetings from Belgium, ladies and gents. Greetings back to you, Bert. You're very welcome here. Hey, Michael Medina is in, saying barfly false at work. True. <laughs> so many of you are, and I appreciate you 
scything a little bit. I uh, hope you've got one eye on the job and one eye on the lounge as well. Good to have you in, Michael. Um, Maramain Martin, another new name. Fantastic to have you in. I think I pronounced that name right, Maramain. Toro is in Welsh. Toro, good to have you, buddy. Malcolm Douglas, good to have you, Malcolm. Uh, David Gillen, another new name. Wow, lots of new names in tonight. Uh, Whiskey Radar is in, good to have you. Saying I need to your dram seems to have somewhat an orangey glow. Well, actually, no, this, I believe, is fully natural colour. Um, this is the Charlton Whiskey. I actually opened it and had the first dram of it um, on the, well, it's a patron on the stream. So, um, yes, this is fully natural colour. There's some really old Buna Havre in this, I am led to believe. And uh, yes, it's rather delicious. So, cheers, everyone. No orangey glows yet. Mikey Hayes in, good to have you. Jimmy Legg is also here, both saying Bath Fly, Donald Rance, Yorkshire Whiskey Reviews, Vin from No Nonsense Whiskey. Great to have you in, Vin. I'm flying the colours again, big guy. Love this polo shirt. Doesn't matter how many times I, wa I wash this shirt, it stays in reasonably good shape. Cressomir is in, good to have you. Christine Deems, fantastic, Christine. Uh, Dom Addy, Dom ADI, another new name saying I'm back here washed, ha ha ha. It looks like a new name to me unless you're signing in under a different account. Dom, good to have you. Luna Aaron already mentioned. So many of you joining in tonight. Fantastic to welcome you all. Um, I do have some other news and uh, I've been asked for a long time about glasses, engraved glasses, Aquavitae glasses. And um, I never ever done anything about it. And if I'm honest, on reflection, it was probably down to the investment. Actually go out and buy the glasses and have them decorated and things like that and have them sitting there in the nervousness that nobody would buy them. If you've seen the glasses already out there, you might have seen them on social media feeds and things popping up on Twitter and Instagram already. That's because they were released early to patrons. Um, but tonight I can share the glasses with you as well because I'm very excited. Um, now, the thing about these glasses are that it's, uh, the channel is founded fully on the concept of it's not whiskey until it's shared. So, of course, they come in a sharing pack. They come in a twin set. And they come in the standard kind of Glencairn box. This is the standard Glencairn box uh, that you have here. Uh, J Chung is saying, does, that, uh, does the recent sale of Loch Lomond change anything from your recent experience there? Uh, I'm led to believe I had an email from them because the, the news came out the day after I was there. And I had a quick email from them uh, just to say, just to let you know that, that uh, everything is full steam ahead, if nothing really changes, uh, the new owners are fully committed. So as far as I'm led to believe, um, it doesn't change anything. I'm still committed uh, to repositioning of the brand, to bringing out good quality malt whiskey, um, as well as looking after the legacy business. So no is the answer, Jay. Okay, let's show you these glasses. They come a wee twin pack, as I mentioned, and, uh, Two different designs. Now I'm really quite I'm quite pleased with these, but I'm going to show you something. So this is the kind of banner style Aquavitae logo. Mm -hmm. Let me see what, what you can see. Pull up the camera here. There. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. Hopefully the camera will focus on that. But you know what that logo looks like. It's quite neat. I quite like the detail on it. And it's uh, sibling glass is uh, the round all the kind of round. Logo. Now, what's interesting about this is that my wife noticed, I don't know if you can see, if I move to the side, maybe you'll see, but it's actually about two or three degrees turned clockwise. And as I looked at it, I realised that she was right, ever so slightly it is. And then I commented to her that after two or three drams, it straightens right up. <laughs> so there we have it. We have um, Aquavitae. Glasses. I'm really glad to share these with you. If you're interested in these, I still don't have a web store or anything set up. Maybe one day, who knows, if things go really well. But um, if you want uh, to get a hold of these, they're £20 a pair. And you can get them, send an email to whiskey at aquavitae.com and I'll happily look after you and uh, sort you out. The ones that are out there, if anybody that's in the lounge tonight has these Aquavitae glasses already, share uh, your comments and let people know and I kind of review style, a trust pilot style, um, whether you like them or not. If you want to make a gift of them, I need to mention this. I won't mention any names, but what's been really cool, and it happened with the coins as well, is that people are buying these things 
and sending them to other people in the community as gifts. The generosity just never ceases to amaze me. It's fantastic. Um, but some people do want to give these as gifts and uh, I guess this standard cardboard pack is just if you're using them to drink with. It's just a throwaway packaging, right? But if you are giving them as a gift, uh, you can have them in this uh, lined Glencairn uh, presentation case. And they come like this. Um, and that's that's extra. These, these are a wee bit more expensive. It's seven pounds fifty extra for the presentation case, but it does make a nice gift. So there we have it. Aquavite Glencairn glasses. They're actually. It's very exciting. I'm not drinking it one yet, but I've got a clean one over here, so perhaps a wee bit later. Okay. Yeah, Yorkshire Whiskey Reviews is saying it does the £20 include postage. No, it doesn't. The postage for this is very, very expensive because the, the box is quite long, so it's got to be in quite a big box with lots of uh, beads or bubble wrap around it. Um, or paper or whatever I use, I'm recycling a lot of the packaging that I get coming in. And uh, it's got to be in quite a big box, so the, the, the postage is expensive. It's £5 UK, £7.50 to Europe, or, or the European Economic Area, I guess, and then £10 international. So yeah, the postage is on top of that. Thanks for asking, and good for pointing out your choice Thanks, Sam. Um, Jimmy, like I said, getting a lot of tobacco off the Glenferic 15 Solera tonight. Yeah, I can see that. And you know what? It's been a while since I've tried that. The concept behind that Glenferic 15 is because they're, they're maturing it. Um, well, let's say they're vatting it in the huge Solera vat that they have there in the warehouse. Um, and they only bottle, I guess, half or so at a time every time they top up. So it's getting older and older and older, theoretically. So it'd be interesting to go back and uh, try that. Jimmy Jazz is saying they're awesome. Thanks, Aquaviti. Jimmy, I'm very glad that you've got them and I'm very glad that you like them. Let's see. Tim F is saying, can we borrow your logo and create them ourselves? <laughs> I guess you could, <laughs> but it's, it costs you even more. <laughs> Scotch for Dummies is saying, your audio sounds a bit off, a bit tinny. Let's see. Thank you for that. Um, Do I sound better now? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, it could be that the, the audio was set a wee bit wrong. We are quite a setup tonight because of what I want to share with you a wee bit later, and I've got a guest coming on, so it's very likely that I made a mess of the settings. Hopefully that audio is a bit better. Amy is saying, now that's Amy. I wonder if that's Amy W under a different account. Is that you, Amy? I think it's you. She's saying the Glencairns are beautiful. I'm so glad that they've arrived over in the States already. Much better. Wow, everybody's saying much better. These things, they never go really well, do they? There's always something. There's just so many things that you've got to fix and set up before you go live. Fantastic. Everybody seems to be much happier with the audio. I'm very grateful. Jules is saying, Jules uh, GUK is saying, Aquavite glasses arrived on Monday and we'll be using them tonight. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, it's uh, it's kind of cool sipping out a glass and gave you something that you made. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Mm. So as I mentioned earlier, somebody asked me about going to Loch Lomond. That was a very, very cool day. It was a fantastic opportunity. I got an invite to go up there so that I could understand a wee bit more about what they're doing. And it came from um, uh, the head distiller, Michael Henry. Uh, he tuned in to a couple of shows and he watched a couple of videos. And I think he picked up on a comment where I was talking about my confusion over the still configuration at Loch Lomond because it is very uh, uh, confusing. It can be difficult to get your head around. And uh, Loch Lomond do a fantastic job of uh, tying the regulators up in knots as well with what they're doing. For example, one of the things that they do is they put malted barley, 100% um, malted barley, but they put it through a continuous still. So it's 100% malt, but because it's gone through a continuous still and it's not been made in a pot still, they can't call it single malt. So it's sold as single grain. And I've tried it and very tasty it is too. It's an on age statement, but this is 100% malted barley gone through a continuous still. Very interesting. 
But what I got to taste when I was there, and this is when it gets super confusing, just I'll try and uh, say this in a way that I can follow myself, and hopefully you can follow too. I tried a blend that was a blend of that single grain, so 100% malt, so it's actually malt, but they call it single grain. From a regula regula regulatory perspective, it's known as single grain. But a blend of that with their single malt. So what we had there was a blended malt that was actually a single malt because it's all made at Loch Lomond. But it's not single malt because one's called single grain, even though it isn't grain, it's malt. <laughs> and uh, yes, but we also had, therefore, because it's single grain, actually, we had also what you could say is a single grain, sorry, a blend, a scotch blend. So they've got grain, they've got malt, that's actually just malt mixed together. So it's a single blend, it's a blended malt, it's a single malt, okay, not legally. So you can understand what they're doing there, all the flexibility that they have to do things like that, that it ties the SWA up in knots with how to manage what they're actually producing. For me, it was utterly eye-opening. They've got a still configuration there, and I, I don't want to go into it in too much detail just now because I do want to make a video about it. And when I make a video about the Loch Lomond thing, it's not just always going to be about their distillery and what they're doing, but it will be talking about how the industry is shifting. So the industry is moving away from mass market blends and let's say cheaper malt whiskey, and they're moving to much more craft presentation. They're premiumizing the whiskey. They're bringing us product that's much more natural in presentation. They're bringing us things that can give us much more of a, of a flavor experience because they're following the consumers. That's exactly what we're demanding. That's what we're asking for. Now, 30 years ago, this stuff didn't really exist. And if it did exist, it was super, super niche. But every week, every month, you hear about more and more products coming out bearing the words on there such as unchill filtered super important you're seeing a higher abv fantastic to see much more engagement much more value you're seeing also that there are distilleries and producers out there that are willing to put the words no color added on the bottle as well and that to me can only be a fantastic thing uh, Jimmy Legacy and I had a Springbank 18 and Optimore 8.1 with my Plowman's lunch today. Wow, I recommend it. It's got wee police cars going there for a reason. Um, Jimmy Jazz is saying the compass box effect. Well, I I think compass box are, are doing that in response to uh, a growing market. And the growing market is one of people that maybe we've got a wee bit more money, maybe we've got a wee bit more time to study what we're drinking. We're willing to spend the same amount of money, but we're willing to have less quantity for better quality. I think that's got a hell of a lot to do with it. Let me just bring up this. Uh... Wow, there's a lot of messages, a lot of direct messages coming in from the Rev already. Uh, he was the first to tell me that I'm sounding a bit tinny. Um, sorry about the audio earlier. Carl Van Wallingham is saying he said received these Glenkins today. They're awesome. Sipping my dram from one as we speak. Fantastic, Carl. So glad to see that. Uh, talking of colour, Welsh Toro is saying my latest Clown Leash 14 seems a bit disappointing. Very below par. Wow. Lawrence's Whiskey is saying I think the audio might be something to do with the fan. Uh, well, I fixed it so it, it wasn't. It was just my idiots even. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jimmy Legg is saying, I'd love to hear some of the details about what their Solera procedure is sometime. Is that at, at Glenfiddich? Um, they actually do a deconstructing the Solera tour. Uh, I did it with the Whiskey Rev a few years ago. Uh, Mike B said, I didn't hear the prices for the glasses. How much are they? They're 20 quid, Mike. 20 quid for a pair uh, plus postage. If you send me an email at whiskeyacquavite.com, I'd be happy to sort you out. Ilya Yanev is in. Good to have you, Ilya. Saying Aquavite, one of your videos made me buy a bottle of Glengoyne 25. I have to say I'm not feeling buyer's remorse whatsoever. It's just amazing. Thank goodness for that, Ilya. <laughs> I'm always a wee bit nervous when sent sentences open like that, right? Uh, Pyle Strand is in saying, good evening, Roy. Managed to catch the live this time for the first time in forever. It has been a while since you've been, been in, but it's good to welcome you tonight, my friend. 
uh, Jason Whiskey Wise is saying he's just getting some dinner and then he's going to join us in about 20 minutes. Don't worry about it, Jason. Take your time. Apu de Geest is in. Apu, good to see you as well. Fantastic to welcome you again. What Aquavida was in Scotland at the Campbellton Festival. Amazing experiences. And the Scottish people are so nice. Lovely vacation. Thank you very much. Kind words, Apu. And I'm glad you had a fantastic time in Campbelltown. I would love to do that festival. I would love to do it. The Rev is saying, no rush, Jason. He's not checking his Twitter chat. Lol. Uh, just like a couple of weeks ago. It is tricky, guys. I need a team. I need a team here. I need you guys to be in the room with me. Brad Leclerc is in. Brad, fantastic. You're joining me on a Thursday. Wonderful. Compass Box also goes way out of their way to be clear about what they're doing. So it makes sense. And uh, Tim F is saying, Aquaviti had my Glengoyne teapot dram. And Glengoyne 18 today, recommended by you. Outstanding. Wonderful. Fantastic to see you enjoying it, Tim. And good to welcome you in. Um, yeah, Glengoyne is now, this, the teapot drama Glengoyne is now long sold out. I wonder how long it's going to be for them to, to bring out Batch 7. Yeah, I can't even imagine it'll be out this year. It'll probably be a next year's event for them. This is a delicious whiskey to start the night. So what we're going to do is a little bit of an experiment tonight. I'm going to actively try and add colour to something while you guys are watching. Um, I did a, a setup video uh, for patrons and I released it to patrons to let them see what I was doing. Um, and it was difficult, it was tricky because this, this spirit caramel is it's really, really ugly stuff. Where is it? It's not here. This is distiller spirit caramel and the reason that I've never done any experimentation before um, even with Rombout, I don't know if Rombout's in tonight, Rombout, Masterbrook, Ayladi, he sent me some caramel that he'd bought to encourage me to play with it. But we couldn't fathom if this was actually E150A or if this was some kind of other... Um, he's actually written caramel E150D probably on the bottle. So I didn't feel that that was a, a, a reasonable example. I didn't feel like it was... You were working with the, the stuff that distillers use, so I waited until I got my hands on some distiller's caramel. Now, just to give you an idea how, how aggressive this caramel is, um, you can see the color of that glass, but I, I'm telling you, that's clear glass. And it doesn't matter how long that sits upright, that never runs fully clear. It's, it's constantly stained. And I'm gonna tilt this to the side so you can see just how thick and viscous it is and how slowly it moves. It's really, really quite thick, gloopy stuff. And to give you an idea of how it smells, it smells a wee bit like slightly, obviously it smells like burnt sugar, but it also smells a wee bit like slightly burned treacle. There's a lot of kind of a, Uh, so I guess treacle is a bit like molasses, right? Or is it molasses? Rob Klumpstra is saying, this is the fastest scrolling chat I've ever seen. Can't keep up and cook dinner at the same time. 170 in, yeah. It does get a wee bit busy. Try and tune in on the icons and the people that you make conversation with. And I guess you, it's, it's tough. I know I'm the same. I don't really keep up with the chat very well, as you all know. Jack Singh is in as well. Good to see you, Jack. Uh, oh, well, Rob is saying I can't keep up and cook dinner at the same time. <laughs> okay, Rob, good. Uh, Jag is saying, hi, I finally catch a live stream after missing so many last couple of months. Kevin Bryant is saying, uh, uh, it's good to have you in, Jag. Kevin Bryant is saying, Aquavita, even Roy sipping on a wonderful uh, Woodford, sorry, a Woodford Reserve straight malt whiskey. Not sure on this one. A Woodford Reserve malt whiskey, an American malt whiskey, fantastic. Not even heard of that from Woodford Reserve. That's Brown Foreman, isn't it? Woodford Reserve, same people as Jack Daniels. McAllen Fine and Rear, the Doc is in. Fantastic to have you in, Doc, saying Aquaviti. I think Glengoyne said the Teapot 7 will come out in December when we were there recently, so they might make it for Christmas time. Skippy Van Pobb is in. Good to have you, Skippy, saying my son turns 21 in a couple of months. Wanted to get a 21-year-old. Any suggestions? There's a few that's still reasonable money. Glendronach, 21, if you're up for that really rich 
aged uh, flavour sherry cask. Um, Aran 21 is quite complex with lots of malt. I'd say one that still stands out as being pretty good value. If you're okay with it being 43%, maybe your son isn't fully there with the, the higher ABVs as well. Glengoyne 21 is always a fantastic buy as well. And while it's fully sherry, it's not an overpowering sherry monster. It's still got quite a bit of balance with it as well. Reb Mordecai is in tonight. Good to have you in, Reb. And thank you so much. He sent me uh, two cool samples. I don't have them up with me, Reb, so I'll share them on another stream. But he sent me a, a Golan Heights um, single malt whiskey from Israel. But he also sent me a sample of the wine that was the previous incumbent of the cask that the whiskey was matured in. So really cool. So we're not just talking about a style of wine so that you can taste the whiskey after it, but we're talking about specifically the exact wine that was in the cask before the whiskey. Very generous of you, Reb, and thank you very, very much for sending that across. He sent interesting subject. E150D is used in Coca-Cola, yep. E150BC is used in caramel sweets. Odd, but E150A tastes slightly bitter. What do you think? We will get there, Reb. But I can tell you there's a lot of bitterness. But it's not horrible. It's not an awful smell. It's just, uh, it's perhaps, you wouldn't want too much of it in your whiskey, I think. But we will get to that. Yeah, London Whiskey Club is saying James Hope Aquavita has the Kalila 22 in the background. Yes, you spotted it. I guess London Whiskey Club, that'll be Jez, I guess, tonight. So I put out a call. I was hoping that somebody would be on Isla over uh, the next couple of, or the recent couple of weeks after Fashil because I knew that Kalila still had some of their Fashil bottling left. And I said, look, if anybody's going to be near uh, Kalila or Lagavulin, I'm interested, please let me know. And uh, Wally Dolier came to the rescue. He had a buddy that was over in Isla and they sent him into Kalila to grab me this bottle of uh, Kalila 22 year old. Um, got a very good score on a Dave Broom review recently. Um, I haven't tried it, but this is, um, now how did they term it? That this, is, this is Kalila that's been aged in sherry treated American oak uh, casks. So um, I don't know if that would put anyone off, sherry treated, but I, you've heard me say on this stream before that uh, we can't complain about how they're making uh, their sherry casks until we all start drinking a hell of a lot more sherry, right? Um, but this is a 22 years old. It's 58.4% cask strength. Isla Kalila whiskey for £130. This is a Fischl bottling. And I'm led to believe that there was 3,000 bottles I think 3,000. It doesn't tell me here, but it tells me somewhere, I think on online, I found out there's 3,000 bottles. So a decent outturn of them as well. 130 pounds. Now maybe five years ago, that would have seemed like expensive, but this is Isla whiskey we're talking about is Kalila. Uh, the feedback I've heard about it is that it's bloody good. So I have to say, I'm really pleased to have this. Now I might not get around to open this and uncorking it tonight, depends on how busy we are, but this will be uncorked. This will be shared and enjoyed soon. Thank you, Willie, for bringing that. And while I'm talking about Jez from London Whiskey Club, I'd like to share this. Now, the gathering in Glasgow, I got given a lot of gifts. I got some very, very generous outpouring of uh, gifts and um, it was quite incredible. Um, but the guys from London Whiskey Club, Jez and James, presented me with this, which is a London distillery, Bimber Distillery. Many of you will have heard of this. This is a really cool little tasting set. Nothing is over three years old. Uh, there's a couple of examples of new make. Uh, there's a couple of examples of virgin oak. And there's a couple of ex-sherry casks. All of these are just a little bit under three years. And uh, this is obviously new make. Um, so very, very cool. And I'm looking forward to sitting down and getting my head around that of an evening be nice to find somebody to share that with right but on uh, the 22nd of June I'm heading down to London to hang out with those guys they're having a bit of a gathering um, in London uh, to celebrate I guess uh, the London Whiskey Club and the community that's building there I'm excited about that because the London Whiskey Club I believe was fully founded 
in this very lounge in this chat room um, a community of people getting to know each other and working out that they're all in London or close by and suddenly there's a London whiskey club and it's thriving and doing great things I want to hear all about that and I'm excited to join uh, those guys down there I've met so many of them already but there's a few more I've still to meet and it'll be nice to shake your hands and share a dram with them I would consider doing a live stream. Don't know how technically possible it's going to be. I don't know what the connection is going to be like down there. But if you're interested for a Saturday live stream on June 22nd, let me know because it might be quite fun to go live and uh, put a lot of uh, faces to the names that you see in this community because there's going to be so many of them there. Mikey Hay, perhaps, uh, although I think he might not be there on the, that particular day. Jez, James Hope, maybe Jason Whiskey Wise, uh, Shiv. Uh, Toby Field, perhaps, just so many people that are in the chat tonight may actually be there. Uh, London Whiskey Club, Jess is saying it was gifted by Bimber, so a shout out to them. Thank you very much, Bimber. I had no idea, Jess. Thank you very much. Um, it was handed to me by uh, Jess and James at the, at the tasting that we held in Glasgow. So thank you to Bimber. Whiskey Whistle is saying exactly my experience. Uh, good to have you in, Mark. Good to have you joining me. All info for Caramel Colour. Talk about the strong aftertaste of E150A. Yeah, I'm wondering how this is going to map out tonight. I'll map out um, exactly what I'm planning to do, Mark. Let me know what you think. Scogsmart is saying, do you think a ban on E150A and whiskey would change people's perception of the final products? Well. I do have an opinion. Uh, I am kind of slightly changing my thoughts on the use of this product in general. I used to be a wee bit more chilled out about it and I'm starting to get a bit more uptight about it. Um, I'm still not going to not enjoy whiskies because I believe they have colour in them. But I do think there are consequences of the practice um, and the, the, the direction the market is headed in is not aligned. Uh, but we'll talk about it a wee bit later. The experiment that I'm going to share with you, I should outline it sooner rather than later. Ben Marnock is saying, uh, which of these, the lesser of two evils, colouring or chill filtration? In my book, where I stand right now, I would have to say chill filtration, Ben. Um, we know there are people from the industry on record talking about uh, chill filtration actively making a big difference on the flavour and texture experience. Um, we're talking about producers there. Now, obviously, it's producers that don't use the practice that come out and say that first. We know why chill filtration is used, because uh, people want their whiskey to be a pure, clean product, and they don't expect it to go cloudy when it's cold. They don't expect to see kind of fatty sediments and build up on the shelf. Uh, they don't expect to see it uh, clouding uh, in cocktails or over ice and things like that. So in order to keep it pure and clear, there's fats and oils uh, filtered out of it. So they drop the temperature of the water, of the of the spirit right down um, to almost or around freezing, close to, and then they force it through a, a very fine uh, mesh filter that removes a lot of these uh, fats and oils. Now, it just makes sense that that would change the flavour, but there are loads and loads of people in the industry on record saying, look, people taste it side by side, and uh, you know, Horst did this experiment and sent it out to everybody, and nobody could tell the difference in things, fine. One experiment of a fairly small amount by somebody who's a, a whiskey retailer reeling, retailing a lot of those whiskies. Um, and I, I don't want to accuse anyone of anything, but it just doesn't, it, it's not enough. It's not enough of a batch. It's not enough of a, a quantity. There are people on record in the industry who say absolutely chill filtration makes a difference to the whiskey experience. And to my mind, if you're removing fats and oils from the whiskey, it just makes a lot of sense that it would. Um, so I would say if I was to get rid of one first, I would get rid of that practice. Um, but it's kind of the same uh, problem. We've got a perception issue then to go over. The people have had brands for years and years and suddenly they're going to start to see the brand getting a bit cloudy. So it has to move in alignment with education. And wouldn't you know that's happening. Ilya is saying, on chill filtration, why is it that if a whiskey is below 46%, it is assumed it must be chill filtered? Well, again, if it's if it's above forty six percent, it doesn't suffer from the same issues. So they can get they can get away with not chill filtering it. But if it's diluted down, it still might cloud over. But also, if it's above forty six percent, it tends to be a different whiskey that's pointed at a slightly different market, more a connoisseur, a whiskey geek, an appreciator, 
um, a whiskey fan, let's say. Whereas 46% and below tends to be mass market product and they don't understand why the whiskey would be getting cloudy. Um, and I don't know what the magic number is. I think it's 45.7 or thereabout uh, ABV um, and, and below that shell filtration is desirable for appearances. What you're saying, I visited a US rum distillery that added caramel colouring to change the taste. Wow. Luna Aaron is saying Serge did a testing with colouring and sometimes they tasted it. Yeah, you know, I meant to do a wee bit of research uh, because years ago, I, that's quite an old article or the one I remember that Serge and uh, the Mock Maniacs did. That's quite a few years ago. It's gone back some years, but I remember it and I wanted to read it in advance of doing this, but uh, I'll admit that I didn't get time to do that. Ben Marnock is saying, agreed, part of the colouring is to keep different uh, releases exactly consistent so they don't look odd next to each other on the shelf. That's true, Ben. Uh, but if there was education, people wouldn't care that, the, that there's a slight variation in batches. And honestly, some of these vattings are from producers that make so much whiskey, they've got so much depth of stock that eventually the colour would just be the colour whatever that colour was, an honest colour, they've got such a depth of casks that they would be able to match that colour, batch to batch. I guess the smaller the vatting, the smaller the stocks that they're pulling from, the trickier it is to keep it consistent. But uh, I just don't buy it anymore. I'm kind of like, come on, you know. And, and uh, like I said, I'll share with you my thoughts a wee bit later. Uh, Razvan is in, good to see you in. Razvan, good to have you here. Interestingly, Ben Riak, 10 year old at 43, is non chill filtered. I guess it probably says on the label that it's non chill filtered as well. So you will see it cloud as soon as you add water, maybe as soon as it gets cold or whatever. But we don't care. We don't care about cloudy whiskey. We enjoy it. The whiskey friend is saying, why does the industry not explain chill filtering? Some producers do, Alan. But the Scotch whiskey industry is still very much a product of its long term past. It's medium term and it's recent past and it's quite conservative and it's slow to change and it's very nervous about market share and market positioning. Multi Haggis Muncher is saying, any thoughts on Daphne new single casks? It's 145 quid, just a bit too pricey. I think the sherry cask was a ballot recently. It was a bit more expensive. That's a very unique thing. We're not going to get a lot of that coming out of Daft Mill. Daft Mill, for me, I tried that sherry cask at the Fife Whiskey Festival. It was delicious. But I'm excited for the next standard uh, Daft Mill release that's just going to be ex-bourbon cask. Um, I didn't enter the ballot for the Daft Mill, but it's going to be delicious whiskey, it really is. I really miss, I've finished my Daft Mill now, and I miss it. I really, really miss it. It was a gorgeous whiskey to have open on the shelf. I came to love that. Probably one of my whiskeys of the year so far, seriously. Squinogy is saying, just put a green... Uh, just put it in a green bottle like Ardbeg. There's one way around it, absolutely. Ard Ardbeg is as pale as white wine. It's very, very pale. No one says whiskey is fine. He's saying it has to run. Have a great stream, Aquavite. We'll catch Ben's bit on the replay. Good for you, Vin. Thanks for dropping in and saying hello to everybody. Jimmy Legg is saying it. I think colour is fine and blends. Anywhere else, thumbs down. I get where you're coming from, Jimmy. James Hope is saying, I think transparency is the key. People wouldn't mind half as much if it always said on the bottle. It's the potential for deception that makes colouring so contentious. You've hit the nail on the head. My opinion about this and the reason it's changed is that as the market is moving to a more discerning audience, we're getting more educated about what we eat, uh, how we move around the world, what we drink all the time that knowledge is, exists in our pockets now. And, you know, when we're spending our money, we're happy to spend a wee bit more if we're getting more engagement and more of an experience. And every producer that's out there is moving and aligning with that audience. Maybe the volumes aren't huge yet, but they're building all the time more and more. And the margins are there just now. They can charge more for a better presented product. And that's very much the way that most producers are moving. We saw it. the theme is all over the place. Every distillery in Scotland you go to, um, every new distillery that starts up is pointing in that direction. We're seeing it any whiskey market, any whiskey producing nation you go to, it's the same swing towards a more kind of artisan or naturally presented product. 
I would hate there to be some kind of shitstorm over uh, the markets that are using additives such as E150A and not declaring it, it not being on the bottle, for that to come out as a bad PR story that the world and the interwebs were suddenly to get their hands on and tell you that Scotch whiskey has been uh, deceiving everyone for years and years, that uh, Canadian whiskey, that various uh, whiskies, Irish, whatever it is, whoever uses colour across the world or whoever uses additives without writing on the label, it suddenly comes out that it's not the integrity product that it's been sold as for years and years. I was struggling to think of another product that puts what's essentially sugar inside it and doesn't declare that it exists in it. And I don't care how little is in there. It's not a case of your little, my little, who decides what, how much little matters. It's a case of it exists in there. And if the market is moving towards that more discerning audience, then surely that's bad news. Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey, any industry, any of the global markets that adds an additive and doesn't declare it, they're not in alignment with how the market is moving. And with whiskey booming across the globe, it only takes one nation to say, we're, our USP is that we don't shell filter our products and we don't add any additives, we don't add sugar products to our product without telling our customers. I think we need to, to understand where colouring comes from, why it exists in whiskey. But I also need, I think that we should be starting to consider just being honest and saying this is the colour of whiskey. This is the colour of it. Once you get into whiskey and you understand it, you start to enjoy lighter whiskies, you start to enjoy paler whiskies. I tried to buy a cheap pale whiskey to do this experiment with tonight in the supermarket and none of them are pale. There were no pale whiskies to do this with. There were no pale whiskies to artificially heighten the color with. They were already dark colors. You go into an independent specialist with all the magic, the stuff that we love. You go into Caden Heads, you look at SMWS, you look at any uh, independent bottlers or you look at any kind of artisan um, presented product. And there's lots and lots of super, super pale whiskies out there. And we love them because we know we come to be, we come to learn that a darker whiskey doesn't guarantee a better experience. Some of the best whiskies, Daft Mill, the Del Ewan and the Glen Burgie that I got from Aaron McFault, some of the best whiskies I've tried recently were very, very pale, Chardonnay pale. Hoyt is saying the colour is part of the experience, which is worthless if you can't tell if it's due to E150A. I felt robbed when I discovered that whiskey was coloured, Hoyt. You're absolutely correct. Uh, Whiskey Weekend Dram, good to have you in. He's saying, nice view. The same with rum and added sugar. Absolutely. These are old-fashioned concepts. We need to adapt and move with what's being demanded. Daniel Vermas is saying they can promote it as a natural product. They ca it can be. You can. It, that's what's going to highlight the ones that are not natural. The bigger the mass of natural product that's put out there on the shelves, the more people are going to ask questions. Well, if they're saying that that's naturally presented, what is this? What, why is why is the one I normally drink not naturally presented? Skogsmar the same mixed Talisker 10 and Naked Grouse. It turned into a shelly, sherried Talisker 10. I like playing with whiskey as well sometimes. Good for you, Skogsmar. He's saying, Kenneth Kennedy is uh, just close your eyes and sip, Roy. There is that. Marcus is saying, I do have an 11 year old inch cow. It looks like the palest of white wines. Do you enjoy it? And does it put you off that it's that pale? Inchgower is, is, is exa exactly a great example of that. Independent uh, bottlings you need to go for to get Inchgower. The only official bottling is a flora and fauna from Diageo that's poorly distributed. So you often see Inchgower and it's often very pale, especially at 11 years old. Whiskey Wim Stewart is saying it's going to have a sore head trying to keep up with this chat. Well, 180 of you in listening to me banging on and monologuing. So let's go on with this wee experiment and then we can go on with uh, bringing in my uh, guest. I also want to point out a gift that was given to me today by Hoyt Hemphill. He saw me eyeing a, 
I'm going to have in Fischl releases, little taster bottles. And he gifted me this. This is a two samples of the Buna Haven uh, Fischl releases, a wee gift from Hoyt. Uh, the Moigne, so this is the peated French oak finish, and uh, the standard Buna Haven and a Sauterne cask, both Fischl 2019. Thank you so much, Hoyt, for your generosity, my friend. Looking forward to trying those. Um, I don't know if we'll get around to it tonight, but they're sitting here, so you never know. Okay, so I have, if I pull over my camera, Marcus is saying I do enjoy it. Funnily enough, it's from Aldi. The Inchgower is from Aldi. I think I've seen that bottling pop up. How cool is it that you get Inchgower from Aldi? Incredible. I guess you're in Austria, right? So uh, let's move this microphone back a little bit. And I'll show you what I'm going to do first before I bring my guest in. So the palest whiskey I could find to play with was this Ardmore Legacy. Now, there's no mention of colouring on this, I don't believe. Um, but we can see, this is non-age statement, so we can imagine that it's a single-digit single age on this bottle. Um, so for it to be that colour, this is exactly the type of product that we would assume has already had a bit of colour added. But that doesn't matter to what I'm going to show you tonight. We, they don't artificially colour clear liquid and make it amber. Um, they're not colouring new make, they're colouring mature product. So they tend to just lift the colour a little bit. And obviously the less they have to lift it, the less colouring they need to add. And I think that's a huge factor. How pale is the whisky to begin with and how dark is it at a point of bottling and drinking and enjoying? And how much colouring has been used, how much that colour has been lifted is going to make a huge difference to the big question. Can we taste the colouring or not? So I bought this Ardmore, it wasn't expensive, uh, actually my wife bought me this Ardmore um, and I don't think she'll mind that it's going, uh, some of it's going to be given up uh, for science, let's see. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to decant some. into a clear bottle that I have here. My favourite distillery is Port Ellen, Greg is saying, and most of them, when matured in bourbon casks and age of pot, uh, approximately 20 to 25 years, are pale like like a, like a dead law, but so good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what was the really old whisky? Lagavulin, a 53-year-old Lagavulin I tried recently, was, was a pale, pale yellow colour. Very pale, 53 years. So it's all to do with how active the cask is. And sometimes it's beneficial to have a less active cask. Sometimes it's beneficial to have the reassurance of a paler whiskey. So it's all down to experience, um, your own personal experiences, I mean by that, and, uh, and, and you know, perspective and education. I've only got a wee uh, funnel, I think. I lost my funnel and when I was doing the Patreon video the other day. So what I'm going to do here, and I've got a, another camera view. This might help. Now let's see how that works. Can you see this a wee bit better? So we'll call this the, the Dram Cam. I think it was Market Whiskey Whistle that coined it that. And I'm going to just pour this. A decent amount of, of Ardmore so that you can clearly see the changes that we're going to see in colour. And we'll just kind of put, a, so that's just what about a third of a bottle would we say there. And we can keep this hard more on hand to see how much we are changing up the colour as we go. So that's what we're starting with there. And then this really, really gloopy, ugly stuff. I'm going to have some uh, kitchen paper because I really don't fancy getting this uh, on the desk. So as a just in case, I've got a little plastic syringe here. Mark Harris saying, Aquavidi, I tried that Lagavulin 52 for me also, lucky boy, yeah. It's 53 years old now. I've had some great Glenords. Uh, it's going to be seen uh, with the colour of Elderflower Cordial. 
Yeah, so I think what we're picking up is that the more experienced we become as uh, whiskey fans, the less we're, we're fussed about having an experience with a, a dark whiskey. We're happy to try lighter whiskies when we realise how good they can be. Don't drop this on a live stream, Roy. So I've, I've got, that's quite a lot I've taken out of there. I don't need anything like that amount. Maybe you can see just how really gloopy and viscous this stuff is. So distillers, uh, I am led to understand, when they use this uh, and when they're experimenting with it and playing with it, they use it and uh, it's diluted. It's probably 10% spirit caramel and 90% uh, water. Pop that just out of the way. And we'll start to put in a few drops into this bottle, okay? Poor Ardmore. Now, I hope you can see how many drops I'm putting in. You'll just need to watch the drops fall into the liquid, I guess. Let's start with, uh, let's put three drops in to start, right? Hope this works. Wow, it's, it's just so gloopy. One drop, two, what? That's only two. Will we go with two to start? Well, the third drop's on its way, so let's let's get that one out too. Three drops. Really, really thick, messy stuff. Pop the lid on it. Now, what we're going to do is uh, the really horrible part, and just while I chat to you, I'm going to try my best to dissolve that. So that gives you an impression of how quickly it's going dark, but how long it's taken to dissolve that caramel, right? And you really need to, it's going to take me probably 30 seconds or so, and the air bag is saying it looks disgusting. And it does. It's not as dis disgusting as I imagined it was. I heard that it was super bitter, and really horrible. It's not quite as bad as that, although I haven't tasted it. I've not had the, the courage to taste it yet. Whiskey Wims is saying, uh, new phone, or did they fix it at the shop? It's a new phone. The old phone I can still use. I can use it as a sound recorder, camera. Uh, I can I can still use the old phone, but it's uh, it's probably going to injure me. There's so many jaggy edges and things on it. Uh, Stuart, so I had to go with a new phone in the end. Nathan DeKinga is in. Good to see you. Bless you. Aquaviti look like you sneezed there. <laughs> And Jason Whiskey Wise is saying, what did I come into watching? Yeah, I know, Jason. But you can see the caramel's almost gone now. There's just a tiny wee dot left. Then we'll leave this whiskey to settle and look to see how much the colour has changed. Set it there, switch back to the other camera and just let you see how much darker that has gone. Uh, now, maybe if I put something white behind it, you'll see a wee bit better. Uh, but that was three drops, and that's gone from the colour of uh, Ardmore Legacy uh, to something that is uh, much more akin to cherry cast colouring. Now, I don't want to go and experiment with this and taste these side by side and try to decide if I can taste... Uh, the colouring in this. I want to do this in uh, collaboration with someone else. And I want to do it with a whiskey that's not peated. I want to do it with uh, another whiskey. And I did it the exact same thing that you've just seen. And I did another step where I made it even darker with a bottle of uh, Glen Murray recently. And I divided that up into three equal samples and I sent it down to a friend of mine in the order for us to collaborate and do this together. So that way you're getting two people's perspectives, tasting the exact same whiskey made the exact same way at the exact same time. Um, and to be honest with you, this guy is somebody that I had in mind because he'd made a video on his channel talking about E150 Color. Um, and he did his own little experiment where he made his own, uh, let's say caramel to color the whiskey. But he's also got a canny head on him and I think quite a good palate. He's very good at analyzing whiskey and I enjoy watching him analyze a whiskey. And for a young guy, 
I think he's doing very, very well at it. And I've been watching the content that he's been putting out there and I've been enjoying it very much. So I was thinking about a, a good reason to, to do some kind of collaboration with, of course, I'm talking about Ben from the Whiskey Geek channel on YouTube. And I thought uh, this would be a perfect opportunity. So I reached out to Ben last week, asked him if he wanted to get together and do this. He said, yes, absolutely. So I made him up a little package. And uh, I'll bring Ben in after I show you what I did to this Glen Murray. That's how dark I made a standard Elgin Classic Glen Murray. This is how it started. This is Glen Murray, a very pale supermarket whiskey. Very good value as well, very cheap. Um, no doubt already perhaps a wee dot, dot of colour in this uh, at, at point of bottling. Then I added a wee bit to make it just a little bit darker. Here we go, you can see that. And of course I've kept some of this back for me and sent some to Ben. And then you can see the three shades there. So there we go. So if you don't know who Ben is, um, he's uh, from down south, he's from uh, England. Uh, you can go over and you can find Ben on his YouTube channel. Very much enjoying his put out, enjoying the content that he's sharing with us after his recent trips to Isla. And he's done lots of cool content already. So I would like uh, to uh, ask Ben to come in and join us and say hello. And uh, we can start to get Ben's input as well. Are you there, my friend? Hi, Roy. How's it going? Uh, very, very well. Very, very well. I'm hoping I'm just going to pull up a window here in the hope that uh, these guys are able to see you as well. Yes, we, we have you, Ben. Welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Are you comfortable? Uh, reasonably. A little nervous. Did I make any sense in that introduction there? Yeah, I think so. It made sense to me anyway. <laughs> right, okay. So what I'd, I did, obviously, is I have uh, put together a package. Now, originally, I sent you three of these so that we could do this in blind glasses, right? So that we could not know and not necessarily be led by our eyes, which are, we very, very much are. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, these are the only two that survived. Yes. I put a little sample, a little bonus sample in one of the glasses, and I, I wrapped it in bubble wrap, and I put it inside the glass. And uh, unfortunately, it was enough to make it smash in transit. It was my fault, fully my fault. So, Ben, tell us what you've done to get around that. Um, I grabbed three of my, luckily, um, every time we drive up to visit Joe's parents, um, we drive past Dalwini, and it's all too tempting to nip in there. So I have about 12 of these mini Glencairns. Um, and so I dipped them in paint. <laughs> so they're now nice and hidden. So what, what you've done is you've taken three standard Glencairns and you sent me a little snapshot and you masked it with balloons so that they wouldn't the paint wouldn't go inside and you painted them black. Yeah. Now, these, these only need to last for tonight. Are you confident that they're going to work for tonight? Yeah. So long as I don't spill the whiskey, so long as they don't get wet, it seems to last all right. Okay. Just try not to drill too much. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. So what do you think the best way of doing this is I've sent you down three little colored dots so we can track it right. And just for the folks that are watching, uh, the palest whiskey has got a yellow dot. Have you got this? Does that coincide with you? Yep, I've got yellow dot on the bottom of this one. Excellent. So I've put a yellow dot on the bottom of one of these glasses. Uh, here we go. So exact same here. And the idea is, is that as, as we are sipping these, we'll see that there's a dot from the inside, I guess, but we can't tell what color it is. Um, and really, it's not us that's on test here. It's the whiskey. So we there's no benefit to us. Um, knowing what we're sipping. So put the dot on the bottom so that perhaps if anybody sees the dot, it's going to be folks watching at home. Then the, the middle one, the kind of uh, the one that's only got a couple of drops of caramel added, I've got a blue dot, right? Same, Ben? Yep, blue one there. Okay, excellent. And finally, the one that's dark. Let me see on your camera just how dark the final one is. Is that picking up okay? Yeah, so what colour would you say that was? Oh, do you want me to get my colour chart out? Got to have one to hand. Yeah. Are, are we at Dalmore dark yet? I This is a touch beyond Dalmore. I'd put that about a shade 17 or dry Oloroso. Dry Oloroso, okay. Um, so pretty dark, right? Yeah. 
And would you say, oh, you've got some Dalmore there. So if you keep speaking, they'll see. In fact, they'll click on to you so they see you. Let's see. It's not, it's not far off at all. Although, you know, there is a much more um, liquid in the bottle than in the vial. Yeah, it looks a bit. What's, what Dalmore is that you're holding up there? The 12, the bottle I've been struggling to finish. So do you not enjoy it? I, it's a weird one. I really enjoyed it two years ago and I bought a bottle for both uh, my father and my father-in-law. I enjoyed it with them, but as my tastes have progressed, I've outgrown it and now I'm really struggling. And I know it's not the whiskey that's changed. It, it was, um, it came up in a blind tasting once and it really caught me off guard. And now I can no longer see it as the, the sherried whiskey that I did enjoy. Instead, I see it as something quite odd and I can't get past it anymore. Understand completely. I mean, there's been times in the past um, that I've felt the same way and you often kind of question it. You know yourself that it's fully you that's moved on. Yeah. Um, but you can often go back to whiskies that you've moved past and kind of rediscover them again and refine them again. That's certainly true for me with a lot of kind of standard whiskies such as Glenfiddich and uh, standard Glenfiddich 12 and things like that. Do you think that you'll ever come back and enjoy the Dalmore again or do you think it's... Uh, um, I guess what I'm getting at is, would you believe that that was a whiskey that's strongly uh, tinkered with? Um, yeah, I, I do think it's strongly tinkered with, and it's one that I I revisited, I think, on the end of uh, my video or, or off camera um, anyway, and a lot of those notes were coming through. Um, I think, you know, tasting and people's palates seem to be cyclic and so at the moment i'm kind of in a, a peat rut on the back of isla and yes. everything everything that i'm i'm tasting i kind of i'm being gravitating towards the peated whiskies and every now and then when i when i do go to one which is you know a whiskey that i really love i can't help but feel like i wish i was drinking something peated so it may well be that after i come out of that and i start looking for something a bit more green and vegetal the the downmore starts to click with me again we'll see you never know you're being very you're being very kind i i would guess that you're probably not holding much hope for that happening right yeah not i'm, I'm not gonna hold my breath okay let's get these poured then okay we've put the, the yellow dot the palest one into the the glass with the yellow dot on it. I'm pouring the the blue dot one, which is the medium colored one. I've only added a couple of dots of uh, a caramel color to that one. And the one that I added uh, quite a few drops to. So there was quite a bit of whiskey in this before I split it with Ben. It was up to about here. And I put, uh, I think, four uh, drops of a caramel in it by the time I'd got to there. It was between four and five. Because when I put two drops in, it was up at this height. Uh, when I then I split the whiskies out, it was down to here when I added another two. So it's kind of it's more than the equivalent of four drops. I hope that makes sense. Regardless, it makes it this color. And this is going to go into my green glass, Ben, right? For the darkest one. Yeah. You already poured? Yeah. Sorry. Right, okay. It's quite okay. a few guys uh commenting that I should look to use it in cocktails or or coffees or you know that kind of thing but i find you know clearly i'm spoiled for choice i've been uh, building up I, I don't like calling it a collection because it's it's an active collection i drink it i share it so i'm not precious about any of these um but because i'm spoiled for choice and i'm trying to limit how much i'm drinking i don't all that often take whiskeys in a cocktail i'd rather drink it neat and so i'm kind of rationing myself in a way and because i'm rationing myself I'm always drawn towards the stuff I'm really going to enjoy, and the is that not exactly premium. in the line in line with what I've just been talking about? We are drinking less, and we're spending a bit more, so we want the engagement to be better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's so many of the whiskies on that shelf behind you is going to give you that engagement. It's going to give you so much more to explore and enjoy that it's easy to reach past the whiskies that you're not engaging with, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and even if it comes to uh, pouring it over ice in the summer or making a cocktail with it or throwing it into Irish coffees, whatever it may be, or Scotch coffees, I guess it would be, um, you're just not, you're not excited to do that very often. That's a, an occasional thing. We are here because we love whiskey and we love enjoying the spirit of it, right? Yeah. And I guess what we're here to, to do with these three glasses now is to discover uh, when 
the color has been lifted, can we taste it? So what do you think? What do you think that we, we sort these out into, uh, I can't, I've just held these glasses up and I can't really tell. I hope people can see that. I was worried that I would be able to tell the dark one from the light one, but I can't. I definitely can't see anything through mine. Yours is completely <laughs> opaque. Yeah, good. Fantastic. But let's let's sip them first, I guess, um, and decide whether... So when we know what we're sipping, decide if we think we can taste it or not, okay? You, you want to go straight to sipping? Yeah, yeah. Are you uh, just you just going to go on nose? Yeah, it's triggering my, my geekiness there. The, the retro nasal, it'll mess with me. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. So let's just get, let's calibrate it with the standard Glen Murray. This is the Glen Elgin, the Glen Murray Elgin Classic, okay? Um, you can, you can. Um, I've already shuffled mine around. I've lost track of which one's which. I guess I can um, always flip them and see. Yeah. You can buy this, this, this standard Glen Murray in your supermarket, right? Yeah, um, it's it's a distillery that I've not really come across, uh, not experienced much, but I've seen it popping up in supermarkets for, for some pretty decent deals. It's always £20 or under. Occasionally it's a couple of pounds over £20, but you just kind of wait and it drops down in price. And, and um, I've had it, this is probably only the second bottle of this I've owned. I thought the, the first bottle was okay and I feel the same way about this one as well. It's not going to blow anyone apart, it's just okay whiskey. Um, and uh, this is the kind of whiskey that I wouldn't be too precious about. So if I was to make cocktails, if I was to use it for a mix or give it to somebody that came to the house that fully wanted to have a whiskey as uh, a whiskey and ginger ale or whatever it may be, I would yeah. be quite happy to give them this. Yeah, it seems like it's a very easy profile, very uh, basics harsh, but, you know, easy drinking. It's quite appley, isn't it? Yeah, I can get apple, um, some orchard fruits. I'd put it more, I'm getting quite a white wine, kind of vinous tone from it. Okay, good. A little bit of vinegary and some honeyed barley. Yeah, I'll give you the vinegar. That's a good one. It's almost like um, when you're using clear silicon or something, right? That kind of... Yeah, a little, a little bit sour almost. Yeah, nice. Nice. And um, the middle one, are we going to just know is the one that's got a couple of drops added, which is the blue dot? Oh, wow. Now I am going to be really, really disappointed in myself if I can't pick up on this blind. Well, you seem to be confident that you can pick it out. You know there's color added to that, right? And you seem to be confident you can smell and taste yeah. that, right? Yeah. Are you not? I know that there's color added to it, right? So right. I feel confident now, but I've done this a couple of times now and I've been around the houses a couple of times and uh, it's easy when you know and it's much harder when it comes to would you put me on it? But let's see how we got on, okay? okay. This is why I, I decided to do this in collaboration because I'm hoping that you have a more sensitive palette than mine. We'll see. That, that's why I'm nervous, I think, is because I I will take it to heart if I fail because I have been trying to kind of educate my palate and that's that's almost... Don't worry about it. There's nothing takes your trousers down like whiskey. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> right, let's stick our nose in the darkest one, which is the, the green dot. And tell me what you think. That's really interesting that it's almost so on the um, medium level of coloring, I was getting quite a Muscovado sugar type tone. It was it was almost suppressing the vinous elements of the uh, classic Elgin on its own. Um, but on the heavily colored one, it's kind of gone flat. Like oh. it's, it's not noticeably sweet. It's not got the the original profile it just seems fairly dull i know exactly what you mean now what i want you to do is hold the palest one our original glenn uh, murray classic and the darkest one and then just nose the two of them back backwards and forwards A 
I'm looking for a reaction. <laughs> you, you've got me worried again now. We'll see. Right? Yeah. Now here's here's the thing. There's that. There, just just bear with me here. We're going to go through this in kind of steps. But what we're going to do now, and there's nothing to prove here. The most important thing we can do is be utterly honest to the whiskey, honest to ourselves, honest to the thing. And um, we are not on test here. We're we're just trying to test uh, when we've altered the whiskey to this level. Can we can we pick it out? So I do this at home all the time, and I'm going to switch to this dram cam to show people what I'm doing here. And I can easily, easily just mix these glasses up. And as I'm distracted talking to you, very quickly, I have no idea. I am telling you, I have no idea which glass is which. And I do this at home blind tasting all the time with myself. Do you feel confident you can do the same thing? Um, yeah. I. Okay, go right ahead and tell us as soon as you don't know what order these drams are in. I've kind of already lost track. I'm just wor really worried about not throwing any more of these watch glasses on the floor and smashing them again. In order to help me as much as possible, I'm going to use some whiskey hats. I notice you've got some nice little distiller's watch glasses there. Um, it's very cool. I'm using a, a set of coins that was shipped to me this week from my friend over in Indianapolis, Scotch for Dummies, who will be going live after me tonight, but it usually hits us about 3 a.m. in the morning. But if you're on that time zone, stay up and join Sean, Mark, Andrew, and Drew. Um, for their live stream, they're great fun. Lots of great content coming out from those guys. They're great guys, and these are uh, four separate coins. It's a set of four coins that they've released uh, over at Scotch for Dummies. But what's really cool, and this has got my uh, OCD going absolutely nuts, is that if you look at this, the rolling edge, and you have to uh, align this. <laughs> if, you, if you align it properly, you can get it. To match up and be their logo i think that's pretty cool right that is pretty cool yeah so that's uh, i'll use these as my uh whiskey hats today there'll be one spare and uh let's just uh let's just go right ahead and uh you go first my friend all right i'll uh i'll bring these back into shot and i'll try and line them up with my guess i guess behind them starting on my left Okay, first instinct on that first one I picked up, I feel strongly that I got a strong whiff of what I'm looking for, what I believe caramel tastes like, okay? I'm so confident right now that I would suggest that the first one I picked up um, has caramel color in it. I, I just, first instinct. Let me tell you, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think I've got a colored one as well. You, uh, what are you smelling? What makes you think it's coloured? It's it's kind of a suppression of the um, white wine tone, which was evident in the first place to me on, on the uncoloured one, because that seems muted and there's kind of a, I guess, a dull tone. That is what's making me think that it's... Absolutely. It's so what we're talking about there is the vibrance of the whiskey has been muted a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay, let's go on and see if we can. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you whether that one was the heavily coloured or the the medium coloured one, though. I feel like the one I've got in the middle could be uh, the fresh one. Let's see if we can uh, go for the third one. And Yeah, I'm feeling quite confident just to call these, <laughs> but this is this is when it gets scary, right? Because if you're wrong, you look like a like you say. Oh wow! Okay. Do you feel the same? I think that one's put the um, the first one I sniffed in perspective. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I think. What What do you think? What are you happy with? Um, so this one being the uncolored, this one being the medium colored, and this one being the heavily colored. So you're going in order, and as we're looking at your screen, it's your order, it's from right to left, so it's left to right for you, to the, the untouched one. Sorry, to the... yeah, hopefully that's visible now. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm going to suggest that the first one I picked up and put to my nose was... I'd be... I'm going to be embarrassed. 
I feel strongly that it's the dark one, the really dark one. The middle one, I feel, is the freshest one, the lightest, the purest, so there's no color in my middle one. Um, I should maybe elevate these or maybe use the other camera. So let's see is if I click on mine. Who'll do the reveal first? Me? Let's say this one here, I'm confident this one is my the one that's got caramel. This is clean. This has got no caramel in it, or I didn't add any caramel. And this is the middle one. So what we should see here is green, yellow, blue. Okay, well, I just go ahead and do the reveal, Ben, yeah? Yeah, go for it. Good luck. Okay. This has got to be green for me to be right. <laughs> it's green. It's green. And I've got to say, I was very, very confident about that. This one I'm expecting to be yellow. It's yellow. And finally, obviously, this is the, the blue one. So I called this. That's detectable to me. It's quite clear. It's it's fairly obvious. Would you would you feel the same way? Let's see. Let's you do your <laughs> reveal now. Yeah, the pressure's on now, isn't it? Okay, so I've gone for this one being yellow, which it is. Well done. This one being blue, which it is. So this one has to be green. There we go. That's now, I'm kind of surprised. I thought that that would be a wee bit more challenging. Now, what we have to understand here is, yes, we are not do we're not adding the caramel the same way that a producer would. We're doing it at home. We're throwing it in with a kid's Calpol syringe, right? And we're, we're just kind of mixing it by hand and throwing it out there. But what I want people to look at is how we've changed the color of the whiskey. And if you pick up that first one and that middle one and just hold it to the camera there, because your bottles are much nicer to see that 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 contrast. Um, like that? No, the bottles, the, the actual oh, sorry. bottles. Yeah. yeah, that makes more sense. Just so we see how much camel was actually added. I mean, I don't think that that's extreme. I haven't loaded that, right? It's no. a gentle, gradual color shift there. Now, the third one, it could be argued that I've kind of, I've gone a bit extreme to color it that dark. Yeah, but I, I'd say that the difference between the blue and the green, so the medium color and the dark color, is um, less than the difference between uncolored and medium colored. I have to agree. I have to agree. It's a little I'd bit be surprised damning, by that. Are you surprised by that? Um, I yeah, I guess on the face of it, I mean, I guess my objection to coloring is that you're tainting it, whatever word you want to you want to use. You're adding something which isn't natural, isn't present, and isn't homogenous in the profile of the whiskey. So the fact that you've taken it from a natural product, or let's say a concise product to a fetid product, maybe that is a bigger step than then just increasing how much or how amplified that abnormality is. So I guess, I guess it makes sense, depending on which way you look at it. But I, I would have expected that just based on colors, these were more similar than these. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Let's see what the, the crowd are saying. Stevie is saying, uh, have you actually found the E150 and the amounts used in whiskey actually matters? I'm not a fan of it but the amount that is actually used is so small, is it really noticeable? Well, I think, um, for me, I'm noticing it tonight. In our little experiment that we're doing here, I'm noticing it. Now, am I noticing it so much that the, the, the color would be so obvious if I, if I sipped either of these on their own, um, in isolation? I have to say, maybe, perhaps, um, Ilya is saying on chill filtration, why is it that if a whiskey is below 46% is assumed it must be chill filtered? Sorry, I picked that one up earlier, Ilya. Sorry, I'm just picking up the Rev's uh, comments that he's been passing along. And Alistair Gray is saying, so is chill filter whiskey, just like diet whiskey. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's kind of funny because the facts that we're talking about, it doesn't make any difference there whatsoever. Healthy uh, whiskey is a very healthy drink, obviously, if it's consumed in moderation, Alistair. So, yeah, I'm surprised because I'll tell you what I experienced and my patrons saw this in the first of the two videos I shared with them this week. When I opened the Glen Murray, it was fresh and vibrant and bright. And I think that the, f the freshness and the way that I added the color at that time um, meant it was difficult. And as I was sniffing backwards and forwards to try and 
just get a quick uh, reaction out on video, I wasn't convinced that I could smell the difference. But these whiskies have sat for a little while now, eh, and uh, the way that I've added the colour this time, this this is, let's say it's not screaming obvious, but if you just spend a little bit of time and concentrate, I think it's fairly clear. Would your summary be the same, or do you think you're searching for it? Um, yeah, I think it, it is reasonably clear, but I think it's worth noting that this middle one in particular <clears throat> is probably a flavor profile that I would expect beginners, people, you know, the average consumer to enjoy more. This could well be a more accessible and more friendly whiskey because it's got that little sweet tone and less of the sour note. I could see people enjoying that one, not for the same reasons that, you know, a whiskey enthusiast may come to a, a single malt. But that is entirely on the nose, and as we know, it could have a very different effect on the palate. Yeah, I have to say that, you know, if somebody poured me a glass of the middle one with that, you know, I'd be happy just sitting and sipping it. You know, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be saying to anybody, no, I can taste caramel in this, take it back, please. There's nothing awful, there's nothing suddenly bitter about it, but it has made a difference. Mm. And what you're saying, I think somebody mentioned earlier that there's in the rum industry, they're actually adding caramel colour to actually add a bit of a flavour element there. Now, that's something that I've never even discussed or considered in Scotch whisky. Um, how surprised would you be if that was the case? I guess, uh, yeah, it kind of goes against what probably most of your viewers, most of us who, you know, come to this community enjoy whisky for, but I can see it and there's some fairly good examples out there where it's being used possibly to taper um, a slightly more sharp and aggressive character profile, yeah. it, just to give it a softer element. So it could well be added into things to make it more friendly. Uh, how how confident would we be to, to go as far to suggest that it's being used potentially as a smoothing agent? Well, yeah, I mean, I've always been a little bit skeptical. If you watch very closely um, the, the nose, David Patterson, he gets very precious about some of the other whiskies, but the 12 year old's the first one to go on the floor. So I don't think he respects that whiskey very much. Okay. I didn't enjoy his 15 year old either. I really <laughs> didn't enjoy it. Anyway, um, let's uh, do another thing. What we're, go we're going to do here is I'm going to mix these glasses up again so that they're not in order because I want to do uh, just do one more step just to see. So I'm just going to mix these up again. I have no idea. As soon as I'm talking to you, I'm completely distracted and I can't tell which one is which already. I have no idea what, what order these are in. And you're doing the same thing there. I can see you're doing the same, right? Yep. They should be uh, nicely modelled up now. Okay, good. What I'd like you to do is, if you haven't already done it, just if people can see this, it looks like a glass of Coke, but it's not. This is uh, water, just plain water. And I've got the clear stuff in this glass here, and I'm going to drink a wee drink of clear water, and I'm also going to drink the water that I coloured with caramel as well. Now, this is the most obvious way to taste spirit caramel, okay, because you, there's, there's no denying. Yeah, so I, I've got the two samples that you've given me as well, the same water and the water that's been coloured. Yeah. Are you going to sip straight out the bottle or are you going to throw it in a glass? I'll, I'll grab a couple of glasses. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and I'll cleanse my palate a little bit and then take a gulp of, uh, I know what this tastes like, and it, it kind of just still tastes like water, to be honest, despite how dark it is. <laughs> right, yeah, I want you to do the same thing. It's quite amazing. All right, here we go. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that. Right, so what you're getting is that kind of bitter, acrid finish. So the mid palette the development in the mid palate to the finish suddenly goes very bitter and acrid, right? Yeah, you know what that reminds me of? Um, 
wet cardboard, the, the kind of starchy glue that holds corrugated card together. It's really oddly flat and muted and dull. That makes me think of uh, Phil and Deepa, and a huge shout out to Phil and Deepa as well. I don't know if Phil and Deepa are in tonight, hmm. but they also put out, uh, I think your video inspired them to go off and do their own experiments with it as well. And they started to, you could tell as you watched, they did a short video and a long video, and you could tell as you were watching them, that they were dialing in on the flavor of the caramel. Yeah. They, they started to get better and better at isolating it once they knew what they were tasting and, and looking for. So I, I strongly encourage you to go over to Captain 3D's channel and uh, have a look at the, 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 the content that they put out on this very subject as well. And they used distiller's caramel as well that Phil managed to, um, to source some uh, distiller's caramel to do it with. Um, so now that you've taken a glug of this dark water and you've got a taste of that, let's go back into the whiskies and see if we pick this flavour out of the glass, if sure. it's more pronounced. It's definitely something I found doing doing my video and playing about with this stuff that I made myself. It's kind of educated me and, and taught me what to look for, which has made me see it in a few more whiskies that I possibly would never have picked up on it. So if if there's people watching who don't really care, you know, they're, they're, they're sat happily in ignorance, then you're probably going to be happier not ever trying this. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean by that. I know exactly what you mean, and I think that um, um, there's also a risk that you <clears throat> there could this these flavors could naturally occur in whiskey with no caramel added. Right, you could get you often get molasses, and and I get a kind of molasses, kind of sugary, deep, almost burnt sugar note, and a lot of bourbons. Um, yeah. And you're kind of doing them a disservice then because you're starting to think, oh, that's caramel. I don't like the taste of caramel that I'm getting there. Um, yeah, you, you kind of build an association in your mind that that is a fake flavor and it doesn't matter where you pick up on it, whether it's natural or not, you just kind of call it fake or, or <laughs> think of it as fake. Okay, I, I have no doubt, sipping these three, I have absolutely no doubt what the darkest one is, but between you and I, I'm struggling on the the two lighter ones now. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, I think I think that one's coloured, but I can't tell you. That is the first one I've sipped. I can't tell you whether it's heavily coloured or or not. Mm. I'll go on to my second one. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I'm more comfortable now. Really not a fan of that. Has it become obvious now? Oh, yeah. Do you, do you think the water has helped you tune in? I don't know. It would have been interesting to sample them prior to, to sipping it just in water and see whether it was. But that that was genuinely unpleasant to me. The dark one? Well, I'm assuming it's the dark one. I hope I'm it's the dark it's, one. I'm assuming It'd be it's terrible dark. if it turns yeah. out that it's the uncolored one that I really dislike. I'm assuming this is the, the the dark one as well. This is, I think, this is it. Mm. I think yeah. I'd be I'd be pushing it to say it's unpleasant. The whiskey, the whiskey in there, the sweetened whiskey is not as unpleasant as drinking water that's been coloured. Drinking water that's been coloured is is properly unpleasant, um, but the whiskey is is less so. I, but I think it, it does negatively. It doesn't for me. It doesn't positively add anything. It tends to dull things and flatten things and soften things, artificially sweeten things. Um, there is a bitterness on the finish as well on this dark one I'm speaking about specifically, um, and it is reminiscent of some whiskies that I've tried. I don't know if you'd agree. Sorry, I was mid sipping the the other one. I'm I'm fairly confident 
that one is a nice progression from the nose of of the clean one um, from the first round, and that it, it's maintained that kind of sour note. This one, I I really do genuinely dislike it. You just like it now. <laughs> I yeah. There's there's something very similar to not necessarily Dalmore, but like you say, something that I've picked up in in other things. Um, but it reminds me of so I used a in my video I used a single cast Glengoyne that I loaded up with the caramel, and towards the end I really started to resent the fact that I had ruined that Glengoyne because yeah. I really enjoyed that bottle. Yeah, and it just yeah started to mess with me. So I'm I'm confident that this one is heavily coloured and this one is completely uncoloured. Okay, go ahead and do your reveal. So you're really matching up with what, how your bottles are lined up there then, right? I, I keep swapping them around, but it's probably off camera because um, I'm not talking. So. Right, P pick out the one that you think is the virgin. Uh, that one should be yellow. Absolutely right, that's clear. You're spot on. I can see that yellow dot. This one should be blue. Yep, absolutely. And I'll try the same thing at my side. <laughs> Just... Um, so I think we what we have here, if I do it in that order, uh, this is the medium one, this is the very dark one, and this is the, the so I'm hoping this is yellow. <gasps> yeah. Yellow. And uh, this is the dark one, so this is going to be the green color one. Yep. So t for me, it's, it's clear. And... Um, I think the water exaggerated the first sip I had of the really dark one, um, and it and it made me confident to go into the two lighter ones. So when I went into the two lighter ones immediately after it, uh, when they were a lot closer than I expected, I struggled a wee bit and I stumbled there. But I just paused for a second, and it was clear that I could taste it. And I tell you what, it's a good idea, Ben. What do you think of this? Jason Whiskey Wise has mentioned in the chat. He said one thing I'd be interested in is seeing the same experiment with sherried whiskies and seeing how those profiles are altered. Um, I've still got some, some. No, I don't have much of the whiskey left actually, I've only got tiny little amounts, there's not really much to do anything with, but Jason, I am willing to send you down some of this really, really horrible stuff, um, and if you want to uh, bastardise some of your own whiskey collection to do the <laughs> experiment with some nicer sherried stuff, you're very, very welcome to it. Uh, what do you say, are you up for that? And any anybody, any of the content creators out there, any of the YouTubers, that would like uh, some spirit caramel to play with, I could maybe arrange that um, if it's easy to get it from one bottle to another without too much mess, right? Um, but I'm surprised. I expected it to be tougher than that to taste, but it's fairly obvious. Yeah, I, I think there's probably something to be said for um, this Glen Murray that we used as a base because it... It has a kind of sour profile, which is a stark contrast to what the colouring does. It probably makes it easier to pick out, but that, that's not to devalue it in any way because that is the kind of whiskey that typically, cynically, you would have caramel being added to. So, absolutely, absolutely, and and kind of for me, and this is my frustration with it. I mentioned earlier that you know we're in a situation now that we've been using uh, colouring for many, many years, and we can understand why, because at some point in history, in the late 19th century, people started to put a brand on Scotch whisky. And as soon as something was branded, consistency had to be assured. So they did that through blending, to blend out and try and match the profile batch to batch to batch, because there was a brand on there. And when you're matching that profile and you're trying to get it the same every time, then of course, there's a temptation to try and match the color every time as well, and perhaps you don't have the depths of stock to do it um, purely from, from the natural color, so you add a wee bit of coloring to do it. So this has been happening forever, because people that don't understand the whiskey making process, the whiskey maturation process, the fact that we are taking a natural product and maturing it in something else that's completely natural as well, what happens is that uh, they, they don't, they're not ready to understand or uh, they see it as a flaw when they see a, a paler whiskey. They consider that the darker one was perhaps a richer or better experience. I understand that that's the dynamic. But the audience that everybody's moving towards, all the producers are moving towards, are becoming much and much 
more educated. They're much more into the experience, the flavor, and they want natural presentation and they don't want it tinkered with. They don't want to feel like they're cheated. But more than anything, I'm a wee bit annoyed that there is an additive being added to something. There is no way for us, unless we're in Germany, I guess the Germans can tell because there's a label when color is added in Germany. A mit Forbstoff, I think is the term that's put on the labeling there. Perfect. Yeah. I think we should be doing the same here. If it was yogurt, if it was kids' sweets, if it was anything with an E number added and not listed on the packaging, there would be uproar. It should be the same in whiskey. I don't think that's such an extreme opinion, but it's the way I'm feeling now. How do you feel about it, Ben? No, I'd, I'd wholly agree because the, the people who don't know what that means are exactly the kind of market that these whiskies are aimed at anyway. Whereas the people who are looking for authenticity or at the very least, you know, traceability and honesty, they are already jaded on the fact. So it, it, it's almost splitting the market, but splitting it in a convenient way and giving both parties what they want. It, it's not going to hurt anything, I don't think. I think as education goes on, as, as we continue to become more and more educated and more and more aware, and this, if it happens in whiskey, it won't be the first time it's happened. People start to understand, if it's happened in wine in the past, it's happened in other things. People start to understand what presents a good, natural, good quality product and something that can be perhaps cynically employed to mask a lack of quality. And, and I think that that's where my problem is with it. I would I would summarize by saying, you know, if you've got whiskey in front of you, or if you're enjoying whiskey or sharing whiskey that you know to be colored, please judge the whiskey based on the experience with it. And if you find that you start to taste something that you're suspicious as caramel or whatever, fine. But please, you know, try and be open-minded and don't let the uh, your suspicion of the added use of color come in between you and positive whiskey experiences. But we are becoming more and more um, empowered by knowledge and if you know by using your ABCDs you know age, bottling strength, chill filtration and dye colour you can employ those to understand what that where that whisky is pointed towards. Is it pointed towards you as a whisky appreciator? Well if it's at 40% um, and if it doesn't have an age statement and if it's if it doesn't say anything about chill filtration and if it doesn't say anything about colour then you know probably not. But the producers that are confident to stand up there and say that they're bringing you a natural product that is unchill filtered and they're saying that there's no added colour on the labelling. If they're telling you as much as the SWA will allow them to tell you, that's the most frustrating thing, um, then those are the producers that I think we should get behind and support. That's the guys who are bringing us a much more honest uh, and uh, as Ralphie would say, a, a more integrity-rich product. Yeah, I, I guess to um, back you up and, and almost to reiterate, some of my favourite whiskies are coloured. That I, I never let that put me off trying a whisky. And even if I can detect it, you know, I don't just rule it out. It's like a no-age statement. I don't just rule the whiskey out because of this one factor. Always assess the whiskey based on your enjoyment of it, your, your you know, the whiskey's merits as it stands. If it's coloured and you love it, crack on, love it. It's it's a good whiskey, and that's what it's all about. Don't, you know, be jaded just because of this one element. Absolutely. We're, we're both... Uh, we're both big fans of Lagavulin, aren't we? You enjoy, I know you enjoy the distillers oh, yeah. edition. Um, and I am ever going to be thankful for the rest of my life for what Lagavulin 16 did to me back in 2009. And I know that lots of other people in the community feel the same way about that, perhaps about Laphroaig 10, about other products that we know to be coloured. So like I say, let's not be, let's not turn it into complete over-demanding uh, righteous snobs about it all. Let's just relax a bit but understand the ones who, I think we should continue to celebrate the ones that do uh, bring us a natural presentation. 100%. Uh, ben, are you interested in staying for the quiz tonight? Yeah, go on. I'm up for trying to make a fool of myself again. Fantastic, fantastic. It's been a while since I've had a guest on taking part in the quiz. Let's just jump into the chat and uh, say hello to the folks here. It's inevitably going to spill over two hours tonight. It's just the way it is. I'll have to use the um, timestamps uh, to get people knowing when we're talking about the color thing and things um captain 3d is in, and captain 3d is in here tonight fantastic phil hope it's phil um 
Phil and Deepa. Uh, the wet cardboard thing made me think about them immediately, and I meant to give them a shout out earlier. Uh, they've, they've put that content out in the channel. Captain 3D is in, so you'll be able to click on them and go over and subscribe to those guys as well if you haven't already. They're putting out uh, some great whiskey content, and they're doing it from a very open minded, um, uh, wi wildly uh, kind of, they've gone from complete beginners to really quite obsessed. It's really interesting to watch their journey there on YouTube. They've got they've an a similar collection. thing, like I say, a short video and a much longer video. I watched them both and enjoyed them a lot. So you'll find similar things happening with those guys as well. Good to have you in, Phil, too. What is Phil saying? He's saying, uh, are you pulling out the Dalmore 12 to test next? Ah, there's a good one, Ben. Grab, pour a little dram of your Dalmore 12 and see if uh, this whole experiment has uh, in any way changed your experience with that, for the better or worse. Uh, Greg, already... uh, sorry? I've already spat one whiskey out today. You really want me to go for a second? <laughs> Let's see how you got on. Greg is saying, Aquavita, another funny question is how to recognize a sherry cask from a bourbon cask. One could be surprised, absolutely. There can be a huge overlap in flavor profiles that makes you think sometimes what usually happens is when it's a specific type of bourbon cask uh, that's particularly active in some way, it can give you a lot of sherry notes and you, you think that you're sipping from a sherry cask, Greg. It's an ab absolute fact. It takes a better palate than mine to tell them apart sometimes. Squinergy is saying, yes, the SWA ban inner staves, which is oak wood. Yeah, so they, they, they cited that as an added ingredient and it wasn't allowed, and yet they continue uh, to to allow um, an untalked about added ingredient in the Caramel E150A because they say that they use it in such small amounts that you can't taste it. It might be that we've been a bit clumsy with how we've added E150A, but we've shared openly how much we've uh, altered the colour and I don't think it's uh, so extreme. Mark Harris saying, 100% agree, it's ridiculous they are allowed to hide it. Um, uh, sorry, the chat has jumped. I'm just trying to pick up comments that are highlighted for me. Scogsmart has said, do you think colouring would disappear in Scotch, Irish, etc.? If, say, the US or France banned it in both domestically produced whisky as well as a whisky importer for retail. Yeah, but trade agreements and diplomacy and all that are going to get involved in that. There's so much money involved that it's unlikely that it's going to happen in that way. I think what we'll see is the way that this will be stamped out is the rise of consumer demand. I think that's what's going to be able to tackle this most effectively. Jason Whiskey Wise is saying that would be interesting to see Ben try the one with colour, which he hated, and the Dalmore in a 1v1. That's what I think you're tackling just now, Ben. Um, let's see if I've covered everything. I want to mention quickly that there's, I, I still fully intend to do something with the website. It's been a while since I've done anything with it, but I recently added a couple of things on there and I'm starting to tidy it up. What I did add and what I'm very interested um, is stories from you guys. Somebody sent me a nice article and it was talking about how um, an event that they had, that I won't go into details, I invite you to go along and read it yourself, but I've put a section on the website called Barfly and it's really for all of you guys if you want to share anything about your whiskey experience, your journey, something and you feel you've got a flair for writing it and sharing that in a way that people would be interested in reading, send it across to me if you want me to consider it for sharing on the Aquavite website and I'll happily share community stories under that tab in the website called Barfly. If you want to co contribute to that, um, tell me how you want to be credited, whether you use a pseudonym or your own name. Please add photographs, either of the whiskey of yourself. Um, uh, it doesn't need to be, uh, it's, you know, it has to be polite, of course. Um, it doesn't need to see, show your face. We can have you in silhouette or whatever it may be, uh, however artful you want to be, anything that you think adds a bit of richness. Uh, and I'd be interested to share that with the community. Kieran May, Richard Ustar has sent me across a drama and he said, hi Roy, well done mate, as ever, enough said. Uh, I'll raise a glass of non-colour, there's a little sip left of what I started with, uh, and I've got another nice dram that I'm actually going to sip in a while. Kieran, thank you so much for your dram, my friend. Lovely to have you in Scotland as well recently. Um... The other thing I want to uh, mention quickly, well, there's still a lot of you in. Uh, on Sunday, there's a live stream going out that's going to be hosted by uh, Chris at Last Drop. And he's got a couple of channels together. In fact, five channels getting together. Uh, uh, Prestige Liquids, uh, which is Andrew, I think. I'm going to try and remember these names. Uh, who else is involved in it? Uh, uh, New Dram Drinker. Uh, Caskmate, Matthias. And, of course, Alan Wilson, the whiskey friend, Alan. 
So the four of those guys are joining uh, the last drop on their channel on Sunday. So if you're around at 9 p.m. on Sunday night, uh, those guys are getting together for a bit of a hangout. Um, it might be some uh, fun for you there on a Sunday evening. Now, Alchemist Sevy is in fantastic from a size point of view point of view yeah Sevy would have been a good guy to collaborate with on this because he is actually a scientist i wonder if the e-115 not being on the packaging as it's not hazardous to health any emulsifier linked to hyperactivity must be listed as well as dodgy sulfites and cider well i don't think it's about that i think it's just about you know just you know i understand where you're coming from but i think it's more than that i think it's just a wee bit deceptive if they're putting something in and not telling us especially when there's no regulation over how much is added uh, jay chung is saying wow that would be awesome aqua vitae are you talking about contributions on the website yeah i'm opening up a section of the website so that people um with a flair for telling a story and things like that and, and I, obviously i can't commit to absolutely sharing everything that comes across it'll be select things that i enjoy things that affect me and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to place it on the website as well. Killed Moose is saying, going to have to bail out early start in the morning. Great to see everyone. Sorry you're going to miss the quiz tonight, Scott, but I understand I'm running about 15 minutes or so late tonight. And Alan, the whiskey friend, is saying cheers, Roy. Cheers to you, my friend. Ben, what are we going to pour that's something nice to do this quiz? Huh? What do you think? You're going to let me skip testing the uh, Dalmo? No, I'm, going to, I'm still interested to see how you've got on. So... Um, um, I've muddled them up. I've lost track of what's what. Just like You've lost track. Okay, good. I'm gonna I'm gonna click the camera onto you in a second. Right, we're fully watching you. Okay. Um. Um. So the Dalmo should be in the one with the blue dot. Um. I don't don't know which one is which. I'm gonna skip the nose because I'm certain that'll pick it up fine on the nose. And I have a feeling what Captain 3D really wants to see is me gag on the palate again. So I'll uh, I'll go straight to sipping. Okay. That that one, I'm I'm confident that one is the heavily coloured Glen Murray. Okay, good. And it makes the da Dalmore taste positively nice. <laughs> there we go. That's what I need. <laughs> good, good. I'll actually finish that. So just verify that you're that, that you are right. Hmm. Am I wrong? No, I forgot what I said. That one, yeah, that one should be Dalmo, shouldn't it? Blue. Okay, yes, you put the Dalmo in the blue glass. Oh, I saw a flicker of panic across your yeah. face. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Uh, uh, excellent. Okay. Uh, let's get this quiz started. Um, so I guess everybody that's in here tonight are going to know what the quiz is all about. It's fully uh, multiple choice. It's fully just you playing against yourself. Um, there's nothing at stake. There's no prizes or anything, just a bit of personal kudos. And uh, there are folk out there that are still trying to get the magic 10 out of 10. Have you ever had 10 out of 10 on the quiz, Ben? I haven't, no. I've come close a couple of times, and I've done terribly a couple of times. Um, do you want to have prizes? Uh, no, not really, because okay. I think uh, it was pointed out to me a couple of times that prizes add an ugly element to things. Okay. And I can uh, I can uh, kind of understand what that what that is. You know, it's it's nice that it's just a kind of celebration of a good score and a kind yeah. of kicking yourself in a fun way when it's a not so good score. So I kind of prefer that. So let's see. Uh, let's get this quiz up and running. Present. Hopefully that's going to pop up. Hopefully we're on there. Now, what I didn't do is check this quiz tonight. I was in a bit of a rush. Let's just go through and uh, double check the slides are all in order. It looks like they are. Okay. So for you, Ben, I guess that what we can do is just pause for a second, then you give me your guess before I do the reveal, and you can keep your own sc score live. Are you okay with that? Sure. And now we've got a kind of five, six, ten second, maybe at the most, uh, jump on the, the chat. So uh, theoretically, you could feed from the chat and take answers from those guys. Uh, but uh, there is a bit of a delay, and I know that you wouldn't do that. Anyway, I know that you 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 like to play this on your own. Uh, Jimmy Jazz is saying, I need education, not prizes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I can't promise you, uh, Jimmy, but I'll do my very, very best to, to try and 
share some things in order to pique our curiosity and have us learning more about the subject all the time. George Braley, good to have you in. George is saying, uh, give the Dalmore 12 away as a prize. <laughs> no, let's not. No prizes. Okay. Uh, let's get on with uh, question one. You ready, Ben? Yep, ready as I'll ever be. Which distillery just announced the first distillation in a century, a century, my goodness, and using oats? Which distillery just announced the first distillation in a century using oats? Was it A, Lone Wolf, B, Eden Mill, or C, Inchderney? A, Lone Wolf, B, Eden Mill, or C, Inchderney? So it was about early 20th century, the last time there was any serious distillation done in Scotland from an oat mash. I understand that they're having to add a significant amount of uh, malted barley, obviously malted barley containing all those lovely enzymes to get the conversion happening. Um, so Ben, what do you think? What would you guess? I, I'm not 100% certain, but I think I read about this recently. I'm going to go with C. So you think it was inch Dearney? I think so. Okay, let's have a let's have a quick look at the chat. A huge amount of folk in the chat agree with you, Ben. They think that it's Inch Dearney that is now experimenting with uh, distilling oats, and let's see, it is of course Inch Dearney. So yes, it'd be interesting to see. It's going to take a while for us to see what what that produces, but of course, uh, it's not made from 100% malted barley. So that means that when it is sold. Um, it's going to be uh, sold as single grain from Inch Dearney. Um, but it is a 51% oat mash bill with the rest of it made up of malted barley. Okay, question two. Of this year's Fischiel bottlings, which did Dave Broom score as the highest and quoted it as a steal? It's an interesting one, right? He, he quoted it, he said it was the, he gave it the highest score and he said it's a steal. Was it A, Kilhoman, B, Ardbeg, or C, Kalila? A, Kilhoman, B, Ardbeg, or C, Kalila? What do we think? What was rated? Now, this was on the scotchwhiskey.com website. Uh, Dave Broom uh, did a resume of all the, well, the, let's say the mainstream, the standard uh, Isla Fischiel uh, releases from the distilleries, none of the independent bottlings or anything, eh, which there's more and more springing up of all the time, can only be a good thing, right? Um, but he scored this one uh, fairly high marks out of 100 and said at the price, um, it was a steal. What do you think, Ben? I'm going for C again, 22 year old Kalila, seems like a steal to me at 130 quid. Yeah, do you agree? Let's have a look. He did, Kalila. Now, while I mean, I don't know if for sure if my palate would align with Dave Broom, I mean, it is kind of encouraging that he gave it such a healthy score and he wrote some nice things about it. Um, um, but it was just pure fortune that uh, that's the one that I ended up with. That's the one I was keen for. That's the one I asked for. Um, and it was the reason I was drawn to it was I thought for that age of product, uh, the profile from that distillery for £130 at cast strength, I thought that's got to be great value as well. But yeah, that bottle is not being held prisoner. That will be opened and shared. Would you like some, Ben? Absolutely, if you're offering. I, I tried. My network obviously isn't as large as yours, but I tried to get a hold of a bottle as well. Well, all you have to do is uh, remind me that I promised you because I'm likely to kill this stream tonight and forget completely. I should make a note, in fact. Well, probably I'll be opening it in a live stream, right? So you can remind me if you don't have any of it uh, happening. It's a very generous offer. Step soon. Okay, question three. This is an easy one. An easy one. Anok single malt is produced at which distillery? A. Nock. B. Nakandu. C. Nokdu. Anok single malt is a brand produced at which distillery? A. Nock. B. Nakandu. Or C. Nokdu. Question three. So the chat hasn't lit up yet. What do you think, Ben? I'm going with C. Very. The reason that they're calling it a knock rather than knock do is because they're in close proximity to knock and do. And knock and do obviously is confusing it being so similar. So they've gone with a knock. Okay, you think so? Do you think so? <laughs> uh, it's splitting the crowd a little bit. There's a few Bs in there. Um, 
Jimmy Jazz, Per Christensen, Whiskey Franco, I think it's Nakandu, Ian uh, Roger Christofferson, and Whiskey Jason, I uh, think it's B Nakandu, and uh, well, everybody else is going for C, and nobody's choosing Knock, funnily enough. Uh, because, of course, I have uh, completely invented that distillery. So it's between B and C, Nakandu or Nokdu. But Anok is made at Nokdu um, exactly for the reasons that you said, Ben. There was some confusion over branding, they felt, and they um, adopted the name Anok. So well done. Anybody that answered C is the right question. Give yourself a point as we move on to the next one. But I'll mention a little anecdote. There was a, I did the pronunciation video a couple of years ago, you might remember, and um, one of the ones I did was Anok. And uh, I had a really, really angry comment about it was how utter nonsense it was that I was pronouncing it Anok. And there was a, it was, he was a Gaelic speaker that came in and told me that the right way to pronounce it was Ancroc. Now that might be absolutely true, but Anok um, tell you on the bottle that it's Anok and it's their brand and they can say it the way they want to say it. Uh, just like any given name. But more than anything, those pronunciation videos were never ever intended to be a lesson in Gaelic, but just a suggestion on how brands might want their product pronounced. Um, and they're quite happy, it seems, calling it Anok. So question four. Glengyle Distillery produces Kilcarran, but who owns Glengyle the brand? So Glengyle the brand is not on the whiskey produced at Glengyle Distillery because that brand name is owned by another producer. I'll give you three options here. Is it A, Diageo that owns Glengyle? Or is it B, Loch Lomond Group? Or is it C, Burn Stewart? Steve A is saying, it's my name, I'll pronounce it how I want. Exactly, that's absolutely true. If a brand chooses to be referred to in a certain way, then that's just, it's the same as a given name, it's just what it is. Have you got a strong uh, feeling for this one? Um, yeah. Just a yes or no? I think C. Okay. Again. This is splitting the crowd here. We may have a wee bit of a banana skin on this one. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, the Alchemist is saying Diageo for A. Uh, Dave Gillen. David Gillen is in. Good to see you in, David. He's saying C, Whiskey Radar A, Marcus Kreitner B. This one's all over the place. We want to know who actually owns uh, the branding rights to the name Glen Gyle. Now, there was some negotiations had to try and use this, but I don't think they went uh, in any direction. Um, and uh, Glen Gyle produced product ended up being branded Kilcarran, as we know. But this is all over the place, but I can share with you now. Uh, it's a banana skin for you, Ben, I'm afraid. It, it is, in fact, Loch Lomond Group that oh, still right own the, the brand uh, Glengyle. I've got an old bottling of Long Road downstairs um, from perhaps, I don't know where it would be, kind of 2008, let's guess. Something of that order. It's an, a Long Road 10-year-old. And inside the packaging, there's a leaflet where they're promoting Glengyle single malt. So they were obviously, they started that whole project off and they were uh, continued along the idea of it being called Glengill for quite a while before they um, realised that they would perhaps have to call it Kilcarran. Quite interesting. The the Loch Lomond group doesn't have any affiliation with Springbank, does it? I think I've been misled there. Uh, Loch Lomond group doesn't have anything to do with Springbank. They do have a, they have a, a Campbelltown distillery in Glen Scotia. Oh, it's Glen Scotia. Right. I probably misremembered it then. I, yeah. I knew that Glen Gyle had um, the, the brand was linked to a different Campbelltown um, distillery. I thought it was Springbank. I didn't think Springbank had anything to do with them. So You're at a disadvantage for this one, Ben, because you're only going to see this image on the tiny little thumbnail. We don't see the same image on this call as you guys see live. We see a standard video call type setup. So what, what Ben sees is a thumbnail, I believe, Ben, right? Now, if you've got a laptop, you might be able to click on the thumbnail and then to go back to the default view, if you click on, it puts a white box around it to fix on it. Does that work for you? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna share that with everybody just now and show them this is the picture. Uh, question coming up for question five. I just want everybody to tell me what distillery we're looking at. Now, that's a very, Beautiful picture right there, a very picturesque uh, Scottish scene. But are we looking at A, Ben Nevis, B, Dalhoney, or C, Glengarry? 
which of those three distilleries are we looking at? It's one of those things that I'm going to leave the, 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 the picture up there for people just to stare at it. And I hopefully I've photoshopped out every mention of the distillery name. But it's one of those things that it's definitely one of those things you only know if you know, I think. Some people have a good idea what these distilleries look like, other people not so much. Do you feel confident? Um, relatively. I We drove past it on the way from Oban to Inverness, I think, and I wanted to stop, but Joe wanted to see her family, so we didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a huge, huge um, clue to everybody. So you're answering that it's Ben Nevis, A Ben, right? I think so. Okay, let's have a wee look. We are indeed looking at Ben Nevis. So let's see who managed to get that. Oh, wow. Everybody in the crowd, it seemed, managed to get Ben Nevis. Uh, Marcus Kreitner, uh, Jay Chung, he's admitting that it was a guess. Mikey Hay, Marku, George Braley, Pegglestrand, Greg, uh, Alan, the Whiskey Friend, Whiskey Franco, Captain 3D, everybody seemed to know that one. Quite an easy one. So let's move on to question six and see if this is any more difficult. Uh, let me see how you got on with this one, Ben. 10 of Diageo's 28 malt distillery managers are A, doctors, B, women, or C, less than 30 years old. <laughs> so 10 of the 28 <laughs> Diageo managers, there's, 20, there's 28 malt distilleries owned by Diageo in Scotland, and 10 of the managers are either A, doctors, B, women, or C, uh, less than 30 years old. How do you feel about that one? This one's going to be a bit of a guess. I could see it being any, particularly, you know, doctors, a doctorate, and it, but I'm going to go with B, I think. You're going to go with? B. They're, they're very good in terms of equal opportunities, so I'll go with B. Yeah, there's lots of things that Diageo do uh, very aggressively that are often not given credit for, and they're big on community programs, and um, they're big on uh, equal opportunities. You're absolutely right. So, are we saying that ten of Diageo's malt distilleries are uh, owned, uh, sorry, are managed by women? Let's have a look. Yes, absolutely true. Good guess. I was tempted to go with A, but. I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. So yes, we have 10 Diageo women distillery managers in Scotland now, which I think is pretty terrific. Okay, question seven. Let's see how the crowd did with that one, actually. Yeah, most of them kind of knew that. Although a few people were guessing uh, C. Uh, nobody went for doctors. Doesn't look like anybody went for A. Oh, one or two did, only one or two. So yeah. <laughs> the alchemist is saying female doctors under 30. <laughs> Do you know, it could be true. I should have, I suppose I should have researched that. Uh, it is theoretically possible, I suppose. Okay, question seven. William Grant opened the first malt whiskey distillery visitor centre at Glenfiddich. But what year was it in A, 1969, B, 1974, or C, 1976? A, 1969, B, 1974, or C, 1976. So what I'm asking there is how long have we had visitor centres, you know, uh, over 50 or just 50 years? Is this the 50th year of visitor centres? Um, has there been chat about that? Has there been news about that? Or is it a wee bit younger? Is it in the 70s before the visitor centres came along? How are you feeling about that one? It's going to have to be another guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're quite tightly knit guesses there as well so um i'll go middle of the road i'll go b okay been a wee bit cruel with this one by making the, the numbers so tight right yeah um but yeah the crowd are saying uh dave gillen is saying b lots of people are agreeing with you jimmy jazz thinks it's a simon ray thinks it's a uh, Greg in France, is, uh, he's saying A as well. Let's have a wee look. So the first ever malt whiskey visitor centre at Glenfiddich was actually opened back in 1969. Pants. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a wee bit cruel. But that's it's 50 years now that there's been malt distilleries. Now, to me, that's something to celebrate, but it's also something that I'm really surprised at, that it's not that traditional a thing. Mm. Uh, 
this it's a modern concept that people want to go in and see about these facilities and again it's another marker of that huge shift from people just drinking a product that was brown spirit made in a factory to something that they can really appreciate as a high integrity product it's very much the way the market is moving much faster than we might imagine that is my feeling uh, question number eight visiting blair athol you can sip at a bar made from klein leash's old what a Klein Leash's old washback, B, Klein Leash's old pot still, or C, Klein Leash's old mash tun. So if you go to the Blair Athol Visitor Centre, which I think is one of the biggest, I think it's certainly Diageo's biggest in terms of footfall visitor centre, very, very busy. Yeah, I'm quite interested in these numbers because they're getting bigger every year, it's popular. If you went to their tasting bar, would you be sitting at an old A, washback, B, pot still, or C, mash tun? Uh, ben, what's your thoughts on that? Do you know this? I think so. I think I've seen the picture bouncing around a bunch. I'm going with C. Okay, you and the crowd are very, very aligned. They all seem to think that when you go to Blair Athol, you're sitting sipping at what used to be a Klein Leash's mash tun. Is there anybody going against the grain there? Yeah. We've got Joe Prestera. Good to see you, Joe. Good to have you. Joe is guessing that it's A. He's put a question mark there. Luna Aaron, also A. A couple of people think that you're actually sitting at a, a washback, which would kind of make some sense because it's perhaps made of Oregon pine, a washback. But in fact, if you went to Blair Athol and sat at the tasting bar, you would be sitting at a remodeled, remodified, or modified, sorry, Klein Leash Mash Tun. There you go. So that's a mark for you, Ben. Well done. Question nine. This is a tricky one. I, I wouldn't have known this, honestly. Bit of a banana skin here, folks. Um, I'll ask you how you're getting on scores tonight before I go into the last question. But question nine is Union Distillery is a malt distillery located in A, Mexico, B, USA, or C, Brazil? A, Mexico, B, USA, or C, Brazil? You're not confident, Ben. Nope, this is a total yes. guess. I'm I'm firmly fixed on Scotch so far. I've not really explored world whiskies. Uh, I'll I'll go with B, I guess. Okay. Okay, Union Distillery. I'd never heard of it, but I stumbled across across it today, and I did a bit of reading to find out a wee bit more about it. And uh, and indeed, let's see what the crowd think on this one. Uh, Whiskey Jason is saying C, Travis is saying, good to have you in, Travis Soders is in, good to have you Travis, uh, is saying C, Mikey Hay, A, Matthias is saying C, Pegglestrand A, Per Christus is A, Mark Umaikinen, Joe Prestera A, all over the place actually, but I can tell you that Union Distillery is actually located in C, Brazil, so quite a few of you guessed uh, Brazil, um, they do do a product, they do a 10 year old product, they do a few age statements, uh, they do a lot of uh, other product, they do a lot of green whiskey as well, but they do a malt, and in fact, I think I've got a wee picture of it here, just in case you ever stumble across it. I have never seen it before. Um, clearly, you've not heard of it either, Ben. No, I'd be really interested to have a try of it, though. Brazilian whiskey sounds interesting. Well, I was curious too, and I can I tell you that I went on Whiskey Base, and the score for that is 75 out of 100. Which so is fairly <laughs> low for Whiskey Base, isn't it? It's a fairly, uh, it's not the lowest, but it's amongst, it's down there. So, um, yeah, it's not promising, but I'd still be curious to try it. I wouldn't turn my nose up at it, right? Let's uh, see what the scores are from the crowd. Uh, Greg is on six out of nine, fantastic. Donald Rance, he's looking at a full house. He's on nine out of nine, Donald, wow. Uh, five out of nine for Whiskey Radar. George Bradley, seven out of nine. Great score, George. Matt, 69, six out of nine. Our Baggy Andy on eight out of nine. Fantastic. Jules is on nine as well. Wow, Jules. Fantastic work. Uh, who else do we have? Um, uh, any other nines? And not, we've got Jay Chung on seven. Jimmy Jazz on six. Per Christensen already on a pass mark on five. Uh, <laughs> Joe Prestera, he's only on one out of four so far. He's saying, damn. Don't worry about it, Joe. It's all just for fun, remember. And Caskmate Matthias, who's on the live stream with the other guys on Sunday, he's just joined and admitting that he's on zero. That's okay. You can go back and participate after the event, my friend. Let's go into the last question. And good luck to Jules and good luck to Donald Rance. 
Both like looks like they're on nine. Blair Athol again attracts eighty nine thousand visitors, and or attracted eighty nine thousand visitors in two thousand and seventeen. While Klein Leash, so this is connected directly to that bar uh, story, right? Uh, made out of the, ma the mash tun. Klein Leash attracted A, 4,000, B, 14,000, or C, 40,000. So Blair Athol, which is not far from Pitlochry, practically in Pitlochry, 89,000 visitors. It's quite accessible, quite a good transport link on the A9 there. Klein Leash is quite a bit of a trek further north. It's about an hour and a half, I would guess, north of uh, Inverness. How did Klein Leash get on? Did it attract A, 4,000, B, 14,000, or C, 40,000? Ben, what would you say? Do you know? I, I don't know for certain. I'm going to go with B. 4,000 seems a little too low to me, but I know it's low. Yeah, you're guessing B. So what I'm interested in here is obviously Jules and Donald and see how they got on. If, is this last question going to banana skin them? Uh, people are kind of spreading out. Most people are favouring middle ground, the same as you, Ben. Um, but I can't see uh, I can't see Donald. Uh, they're keeping their cards co close to their chest quite yet. Jules has finally committed, and she said B. Uh, Triketra is there well. Good, good to have you both in. And he's also guessing B. Uh, who else do we have? Is Donald appeared? I haven't. Have you seen Donald? Can you see the chat, Ben? Uh, I haven't seen him yet. No, he's keeping it close to his chest. He's, he's googling. <laughs> he's googling footfall at Klein Leash 2017. <laughs> Donald Rance is also joining Jules and guessing B. You're going to hate me, both of you. I'm going to share with you just now that the visitor attract uh, the visitor numbers in 2017 at Klein Leash was a measly 4,000 A. No way. Yeah, yeah, it's quite incredible, isn't it? When we think of how much we love Klein Leash. I'm speaking speaking personally. I don't know if you're a Klein Leash fan, Ben. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm still kind of settling into it and exploring that. I got the 14 year on, on your recommendation and this Game of Thrones. It's probably my favorite Game of Thrones battle, but I'm still kind of, experiencing it if you like yeah i think there's uh, wonderful things go out of the official bottling um realms and Klein leash and you can uncover some absolute cracking things um so unfortunately for donald i'm really really sorry donald it was a bit of a man then asking right at the end jules as well i apologize uh, but still nine out of ten is fantastic scoring from you both well done and um, it's sad to see that the people don't go that far north. Now, it might change with the huge investment that's getting put forward by Diageo as part of their Johnny Walker visitor experience. We might get more people going up to Klein Leash. But honestly, I'm a wee bit kind of on the fence with that one. I don't want everybody to discover it, right? I want to keep it for us. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. The You don't want any more competition on those uh, signatory single casks, huh? Skunugi is saying uh, uh, he went twice. Hey, Marcus Kreitner is saying 7 out of 10 from a first live quiz, but quite some guessing involved. Not a bad scores. Strong scores, Marcus. Well done. Captain 3D is saying found casks 8673 and 8672 from Signatory in New Zealand. Close enough. So he's talking about 8676, um, which is the magical um, cask that we that I always talk about. Um, and uh, yeah, I found one recently thanks to a heads up from, uh, I think it was Scott Monroe that stumbled upon it and they uh, snapped it up immediately. It's just such a wonderful treat. Um, what other scores do we got? Uh, Luna, not in great scores tonight. Luna, another night for you. You'll do better next time. Whiskey Jason on a pass mark. Jimmy Jazz on a pass mark. Matt 69, strong and seven. Simon Ray on a pass mark. Chris Max Wildlife, eight out of 10. Well, happy, well done, and good to see you in, Chris, as well. Fantastic to have you here. The Callan Fine and Rare is saying eight, six, eight, seven. Did it? What did I say? Did I make a mistake? Are you keeping me right again, Doc? It's always good to have you around, my friend. Um, yes, it's, it is 8687. I should know because I've just bought one. I've got it downstairs and it's kind of got a beam of light shining on it. So, ah. um, I paid over the odds for it. I really did. But this one I'm going to keep prisoner for a while and uh, keep it for some point in the future. I think uh, between the Whiskey Rev and I, we must be through about eight or so bottles of those now. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, 20 years old. 
Uh, ben, I want to talk a wee bit about you before we finish up. We're hitting midnight here. Is I hope I've not kept you up too late. Uh, no, yeah, to have you on, my friend, and uh, tell us quickly what got you um, sharing whiskey on YouTube. How did that come about? Um, it was kind of a culmination of a bunch of things, I guess, um, like a, a brewing storm. I'd been maybe three years um, enthusiastically exploring whiskey and struggling to find anyone to really share it with and vent that enthusiasm with. Um, dra <laughs> dragging family and friends in, um, and it took them a while to, to get, they're kind of getting up to um, the same place as me now. So um, I, I needed somewhere to vent that energy, and um, Joe was getting tired of it being her. So one, one morning I was sat um, continuing my binge watch of your channel after I, I found it, and uh, she gave me a shove in that general direction. Um, there was a bunch of stuff work-wise. Uh, I got promotion, got a bit of extra time, um, and you know my hobbies. I couldn't commit to giving every weekend and all that kind of stuff. So it just all kind of came together. Um, and as the community began to engage with me, I got really stuck into it. Really, it, you know, it became a lot of fun, and it's just snowballed. And that's yeah. I have to say, I've I've enjoyed. You do bring a value. You do bring a real value to the scene. I think you've got um, a palette and a head on you that's well beyond your years. And um, enjoy your content. Um, I wish you didn't use DJ Quad's soundtrack music because <laughs> every man and his dog is doing it, and I get a hard time all the time for copying the Whiskey Tribe um, for, uh, <laughs> DJ Quads from them specific tracks. Even even though I was the first. Um, uh, but I don't really care. I'm, I'm only just kidding with you. I don't really mind at all. And I don't think I've ever said anything about it to you. Now, um, if you have any suggestions for anyone else to use, then I'm open to it. The yeah, I know that's the thing, isn't it? Because it's tough to get that thing that isn't that isn't twee and chintzy and Scottishy and shortbread tins and yeah. you know that kind of thing. So um, it is difficult. And to be honest, I've tried to move away from DJ Quads. You might notice that there's a video that went out recently that... Uh, the Ardenhoe video that I, I moved away from DJ Quads for a little bit, but um, you know, there's certain things like the recycled reviews. I'm kind of that the DJ Quads uh, soundtrack there is kind of ingrained into the identity of those videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm just dis I'm distracted away from the content that you're putting out. I think you're putting out very good content, and I think you are bringing an insightful value. And I encourage everybody that's joined us tonight to go over and check out some of uh, Ben's content. And if you enjoy it, give him a wee thumbs up. And consider subscribing to them. Um, are you are you enjoying it? You planning to stick it out? Yeah, definitely for as long as I can. We've got a, a little one on the way, which is going to throw a spanner in the works. But um, I've got another six distillery tours to uh, actually edit together. I've got a stack of reviews and other fun little things planned. So yeah, I'm going to crack on for as, as long as I can. And anyone who wants to come along and and uh, give me some grief is more than welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the biggest bonus, and I don't know if you, you knew that it was going to be the thing when you started out, but the biggest bonus is that sense of friendship, connectedness, that sense of community and the wonderful, wonderful interactions you can have. It's really, it's a fantastic uh, community to be a part of. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's really been the draw for me and what's made it um, become such a passion. Yeah. Well, I'm going to raise a wee glass to that. I have what I've got left of a gift from Scott, eh, from Scotch Test Dummies. Can you see what this says? It says Tobias and the Angel. Uh, so we were, talk we were talking about Klein Leash. Um, and this is a, what I guess is a John Glazer's attempt at a, a modern brora. Um, so this is a old Klein Leash and old, uh, old Kalila uh, blended together in a kind of double malt, a blended malt. Um, I've tried this. It's absolutely fabulous. I wish I could share it with you, my friend, but it's my last wee dram. Have you got something you can uh, you can uh, raise a glass I'm, with? I'm finishing off this uh, Glen Murray, unfettered Glen Murray. The clean one. Good for yeah. you. Good for you. Listen, I apologise to everybody in the lounge tonight for me not interacting as much as I usually do. I hope you appreciate that's because I did have a, a very charming and uh, insightful guest in joining me tonight. And we were doing a kind of more focused uh, thing with this uh, colouring thing tonight. But everything will be back on to a uh, normal uh, normal VPUB um, fodder uh, two weeks from now. So please join me then. We're on the 13th, so I guess that's going to be the 27th uh, for the next regu regular scheduled VPUB. But I would like to try and attempt to bring you a, 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 
a stream, a live stream of EPUB from the event down in London, a kind of gathering that's coming together there to celebrate the London Whiskey Club. Um, and remember, the London Whiskey Club is going. Uh, they've got a YouTube channel as well that you can subscribe to. And uh, uh, if you're interested in joining uh, the London Whiskey Club, get in touch with uh, Jez. Uh, you can also get in touch with uh, Jason Whiskeywise, uh, with Mikey Hay, with any of the members, James Hope, Toby Field, any of the members that hang out here regularly. There is an email address. I don't have it at hand right now, but they're a present across all social media as well. So I would like to take the opportunity of sitting with uh, those guys there and maybe attempting a live stream. Whiskey Radar is saying, great VPUB again. Thanks, Roy. See you next time. Thank you for joining Whiskey Radar. Wonderful to have you. Hoyt is in. Thanks for all your hospitality. Have to catch some off to Ochentoshin tomorrow. Yes, Hoyt, get rest that leg. You had a poorly leg when I saw you uh, last night as well. Uh, Christine Deems is saying, great live stream, Roy. Thank you, Christine. Thanks for joining. Luna Aaron is saying, we were heavily interacting. Uh, yes, you were amongst yourself, all the barflies hanging out together. Good for you. Daniel from Massa saying good night, Aquavita, good night all, good night Daniel, wonderful to have you. Uh, Service Alafis Andreas is in, of course, good to have you. Great steam, Roy, uh, Aquavita and Ben. Uh, George Braley saying just to, just subscribe to Whiskey Geek. How many subs are you at now, Ben? Um, it was like 385, I think, before I came in Doing here. Well. Doing well, good for you. Per has just dropped in a, a, a drum as well, and he's saying he's got a little cool sticker, a little animation there. How's that come about? Saying keep it up. Going to raise a glass to you pair and say thank you so much for your dram and thank you for participating again my friend it's always good to have you in slancha and cheers to you simon ray saying no worries it's been great and informative i hope it has been um great theme tonight it's saying hoyt luna aris saying have to rewatch the stream though <laughs> and uh, jimmy jess is saying love to meet all your london whiskey club friends okay good so it looks like at least some of you would be interested in me bringing a stream from London on a Saturday, which would be Saturday the 22nd of June, by the way. Um, Jason Whiskey Wise, thanks so much for being in and looking after us tonight. I don't know if the Whiskey Rev is still with us. It's probably a bit late for, for, um, for him. He's probably got a shift on tomorrow. But thanks to Jason and the Rev for looking after the chat tonight and being so great and welcoming as they always are. Fantastic guys, both of them. Um, and uh, Jason's saying goodnight to everybody just now. Uh, congratulations, Ben, on uh, breaking 400 subs. Thank you very much. That's a milestone for me. Thank you. And I think it's very well deserved, and I wish you all the very best for the future as well, my friend. Thanks Sweet so much for your patience and sitting there quietly while I set everything up tonight. Thanks for joining me, and thanks for bringing the value you did tonight. And uh, we might do it again in the future, my friend. If you're ever up in Scotland, don't make yourself a stranger. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're welcome, my friend. Slancha to you. Slancha. And of course, thank you to everybody. Um, as always in these VPubs, um, it's wonderful to hang out with you guys. It's wonderful to have you turning up in support, as you always do. Um, I'm going to raise a glass to you all and say thank you. I'll see you in two weeks' time. And I uh, apologise if I've forgotten anyone, but I like to watch the stream over after the event. Um, and that's when I pick up all the comments and people that I forgot to mention and say thanks for joining. Um, but it was a nice busy stream tonight, and I thank you all for joining. And uh, as I raise a glass, I'll say once more, Barflies, you did not drink alone. Slancher. <laughs>